John, we're live again. All right, let me just double check that, please. Okay, what we're gonna do is uh, start from the beginning. So uh, again, uh, Sergeant Zadowski, please, with your opening statement. Okay, and good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations, jointly with the Committee on General Welfare. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you. We are ready to begin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the New York City Council. I am council member Vanessa L. Gibson of District 16 in the Bronx. I am proud to serve as chair of the city council's committee on oversight and investigations. Today, we are holding a joint hearing with the city council's committee on general welfare on the city's audit of shelter providers. In February, the New York Times released an investigative report on the financial mismanagement and allegations of sexual misconduct at a homeless shelter in the borough of the Bronx. The report detailed the city's knowledge of many of these misdeeds and in response, Mayor Bill de Blasio called for an, an audit of all of the city's shelter providers. Today at this hearing, we seek to understand the scope of the administration's audit and to better understand the city's process for overseeing all shelter providers. The residents and clients of our shelters include many of our most vulnerable individuals in the city of New York. We place an enormous amount of trust and confidence in all of our shelter providers to ensure that residents are safe and cared for and to do so honestly and not for personal gain. Today, we hope to ensure that the city is doing everything it can to make sure that our trust is not broken. The committees today will also hear several pieces of legislation, including proposed introduction 2056A, sponsored by Council Member Keith Powers, which would require officers and employees of city contractors to report corruption and to cooperate with the Department of Investigation. Introduction 2284, sponsored by Council Member Helen Rosenthal, which would establish a survivor centered response by the Department of Social Services for complaints of sexual assault or sexual harassment by DSS employees or contractors. Introduction 2285, also sponsored by Council Member Helen Rosenthal, which would require the establishment of standards and procedures to determine the existence of conflicts of interest and other misconduct concerning city contracts. Finally, on today's agenda, introduction 2292, which I am proud to have introduced, which would require the Department of Investigation to include misconduct investigations by city employees and contractors in their annual report. This bill will provide greater transparency and accountability with respect to both misconduct by city employees and contractors, as well as the city's process for investigating that misconduct. I'd like to thank the members of the administration who are here with us to testify, all of my colleagues and members of the public for joining us today. I'd like to acknowledge the staff of the Oversight and Investigations Committee, Ed Atkin, Jonathan Masterano, Emily Rooney, Janita John, Justin Kramer, and Noah Meeksler for all of your help in putting today's hearing together. I'd like to acknowledge the members who have joined us today for this hearing, Councilmember Keith Powers, Councilmember Barry Gridenchik, Councilmember Oswald Feliz, welcome and congratulations, colleague, Councilmember Brad Lander, Councilmember Eric Dinowitz, congratulations and welcome, colleague. 
Council Member Colina Rivera, Council Member Diana Ayala, and Council Member Brad Lander, and Council Member Ben Kalos. And with that, I'd like to turn this hearing over to my co-chair, the Chair of the Committee on General Welfare, Chair Steve Levin. Thank you all and welcome. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Council Member Adrian Adams as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Gibson. Um, thank you to members of the administration that are here. Uh, good morning and welcome everybody to this hearing on the City Council's Committee on General Welfare jointly with the Committee on Oversight and Investigations. I'd like to thank my colleague, Chair Vanessa Gibson, for convening this hearing. Today, the committees will examine the city's audit, audits of shelter providers, as well as hear several pieces of legislation. In fiscal year 2021, DHS awarded $1.8 billion for 288 homeless family services, service contracts and 143 for individual homeless service contracts. DHS contracts with 75 providers who carry out the services for those in the system. It is imperative that agencies like DHS have procurement, evaluation, and assessment processes that are thorough and comprehensive in order to ensure that services meet expectations and that any operational issues will be swiftly and appropriately addressed. In the course of the contracting process, any DHS shelter provider may be subject to audit by the city and state controller's offices, as well as the New York State Office of Temporary and disability assistance. On February, first, uh, excuse me, on February 7th, 2021, as Chair Gibson mentioned, the New York Times released an investigative report into dealings of Victor Rivera, the CEO of Bronx Parent Housing Network, which is a city contracted provider. It is inexcusable that the city didn't quickly nor comprehensively address the allegations against Mr. Rivera, which first came to light as early as 2017, according to the New York Times investigation. The women targeted by his abuse deserve to be heard and their allegations taken seriously with prompt action instead of the lagging and frankly apathetic response that they were met with from the city. The contracting and oversight process should facilitate success for both providers and their clients through strong oversight and quality assurance mechanisms, including zero tolerance policies regarding sexual assault and allegations of abuse in the system. It is my hope that the legislation we are hearing today will help to put into place better protections for staff and clients in the future and to better maintain the integrity of social service delivery in the city. I want to thank again members of the administration that are here this morning as well as advocates for joining us today and I look forward to hearing from all of you on these critical issues. Um, Chair Gibson mentioned uh, all of our colleagues. Uh, I'd also like to take a moment to thank the staff, my staff, uh, Jonathan Boucher, my chief of staff, and Nicole Hunt, uh, legislative director, as well as committee staff, Amanda Kilowan, senior counsel, Crystal Pond, senior policy analyst, Natalie Omery, policy analyst, and Frank Sarno, fi finance analyst. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge, of course, Chair Gibson and the staff on the Committee of Oversight and Investigations. With that, I'll turn it back over to Chair Gibson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Steve Levin. We look forward to today's conversation on a very important matter. I'd now like to recognize our colleague who has sponsored a bill on today's agenda. I'll now turn this hearing over to Council Member Keith Powers for opening remarks. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Thank you to Chair Gibson and thank you to Chair Levin for allowing me to say a few words before you start. Glad to join everyone on this Friday. It's good to be Friday, uh, uh, but also to have a, such a really important hearing on uh, oversight hearing on the city's audit of shelter providers and including the bill that I have here today, which is about whistleblower protections here in New York City. My bill proposed intro 2056 requires officers and employees of city contractors and subcontractors to report corruption and to cooperate with the department of investigation. The idea of this bill actually came as a result of a hearing that this committee conducted last year, and I think believe is a recommendation from uh, the commissioner of the DOI as well, related to whistleblower protections. 
Um, charter 68 of the city charter sets out a code of ethics for city employees and prohibits conflicts of interest for public servants. However, it's unclear whether the specific conflict of interest standards for officers and are, are, are also for officers, employees, and contractors, and they are subcontractors or independent contractors who do business with the city in various capacities. In addition, there's no duty to report requirement regarding conflicts of interest and other misconduct when it comes to city contract contracts. The city's whistleblower law prohibits an officer or employee of a contractor or a subcontract that is party to a contract with the city agency that has a value that's a value of over $100,000 from taking an adverse personnel action with respect to another officer or employee of the contractor for reporting misconduct, such as corruption, criminal activity, conflict of interest, gross misimagined abuse of authority by any officer or employee of a contractor. However, the existing language does not require an officer or employee of a contractor to actually make such reports to the commissioner of department investigation or to cooperate with investigations. And that's what my bill will seek to resolve here today. So uh, I want to thank again, Chair Gibson and Levin for allowing me an opportunity to say some words and hearing this bill today. I want to thank Council Members Kalos, Chin, and Diaz for their support and sponsorship of the bill. And look forward to hearing more from the agency about my legislation. Thanks so much. Thank you, Council Member Powers. And now I'd like to turn this over to another colleague who has two bills on today's agenda. I'll turn this hearing over to Council Member Helen Rosenthal for opening remarks. Oh, I'm unmuted. Great. Okay, thank you very, very much for that. Good morning. I'm Council Member Helen Rosenthal. My pronouns are she and her, and I want to begin by thanking Chairs Gibson and Levin for holding this hearing and for including my bills. I think the night we all read that New York Times article, we were all on the phone with each other, and you all followed through just so quickly to have this hearing. Thank you. Intro 2284 was a response to the disturbing cases of sexual assault and harassment experienced by clients and employees of the Department of Social Service Contracted Homeless Service Provider. The perpetrator of abuse was the director of the organization, someone above all whom the city had placed trust in. What, it set, what upset me most about the situation was that a survivor had reached out to government offices for support multiple times, only to be directed back to the board of directors of the organization led by their abuser. Let's be clear, city government let all of these survivors down. The first response to any survivor who comes forward must be, I believe the survivor and I wanna make sure that that individual is getting all of the support they need. It's long overdue that the city put process procedures in place so it can respond appropriately and quickly when survivors come forward. This draft legislation is a step in the right direction by ensuring that survivors are believed, connecting them to resources like counseling and protecting them from further individual and systemic harm. We welcome your testimony today, especially from survivors, victims and service providers, as we hammer this bill into a true reflection of what the best possible response can be. Intro 2285 comes from a similar place, the need to drastically improve our systems of accountability for government contracted organizations. But I wanna stress that we realize there are many complexities in how we go about establishing this systems, these systems. And what we don't wanna do is make it more difficult for the very excellent providers to, to do their very good work. So I'm well aware that this bill may change considerably 
And that's why this hearing is so important. We really do welcome your input today and in written testimony following the hearing. Above all else, we need to ensure that all future survivors receive due process and are treated with the respect, consideration, and dignity that they deserve. Thank you, Chairs Gibson and Levin, um, and everyone who's here today, I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Councilmember Rosenthal, for your heartfelt words. And I share your sentiments and agree wholeheartedly that we as a council, as an administration, have to do everything possible to believe uh, those that come forward with their stories. We have to encourage them and give them the strength they need, but the resources as well. Uh, Trauma-informed care, wraparound services, and access to healthcare, mental health services, it is really a critical part of our work. Um, and I represent many, many families and individuals who live in shelters every single day, temporary housing. And so we want to allay a lot of their concerns, a lot of their anxieties. Um, you know, when that story broke in February, it was alarming, but I think it also shocked many of us because we realized that this was documented, but we understand that there are probably many other cases that we may not know about because people fear coming forward because of retribution, because of discrimination. No one wants to lose the roof over their head. And I think the last year of COVID-19 has reminded us so much of the value of affordable housing in the city of New York. Um, and so I thank you so much and thank you to all of my colleagues who are here with us as well because today's hearing is very, very important as we move forward. And certainly since we are in the midst of a budget season for the FY22 season. Um, I'd like to recognize council member Calvin Yeager has also joined with us. And we are just momentarily waiting for another colleague to join us. She's chairing a hearing at the same time and I want her to provide opening remarks as well. Uh, and that is council member Dharma Diaz. So if we could just pause for one second uh, while she logs on, um, Sergeant at Arms, I'd appreciate that. And uh, Chair, I'm just going to give a, a quick disclaimer. I'm uh, I'm going to be also balancing some parental duties, so there's going to be a, a moment um, or a, a period of time in the uh, during I think the administration's testimony and Councilmember Gibson's Chair Gibson's uh, questioning, where I'm going to be either off video or in in my car picking up my daughter. But that's um, just want to give fair warning on that.
Folks, thank you for your patience. As we stand at ease, we should be reconvening momentarily. Thank you. Chair Gibson, we have um, Councilwoman Diaz. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And our apologies for the delay. Uh, our hearing will continue. And I'd like to acknowledge and recognize my colleague for opening remarks before today's hearing begins, Councilmember Dharma Diaz. Councilmember, you're on mute. Have I been unmuted? Yes, you have. Thank you again. I just want to thank you to my colleagues for waiting for me as I was chairing uh, another meeting today. I just want to be brief and thank you to my colleague, my colleagues and the Chair of General Welfare for hosting this conversation here today. I'm definitely saddened and dismayed on the results of what's happened to women who were turned over to a specific shelter, which we will be discussing today the maltreatment of, in, of individuals, it's unfair, it's unjust. We, we cannot continue to allow for providers to benefit and hardship individuals. Again, I, I wanna thank you. I worked 13 years within the shelter system. And when I learned of the case that we're gonna be discussing today, it broke my heart and brought me to tears. Vulnerable people, individuals that were victimized by a sick individual that had not only profited from their hardship, but of their, their brokenness. So again, I, I thank you to my, my colleagues. I know it's a sensitive conversation and I truly hope that you bring them to task. When we audit an organization, we're supposed to see seeing through and I'm sure there were triggers that were overlooked and that's not okay. It is our job, our role, our responsibility as government to ensure that we take care of our population. Again, thank you and I'll turn it off to my colleagues. Thank you again. Thank you, Council Member Dharma Diaz and thank you, Chair Levin, Council Member Powers, Council Member Rosenthal for all of your opening remarks. I'd now like to turn this hearing over to our moderator, Senior Legislative Counsel, Amenta Kilowan to go over some procedural items as we begin. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Gibson, and good morning, everyone. I am Aminta Kilowan, Senior Legislative Counsel to the General Welfare Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted. I will be calling on witnesses to testify, so please listen for your name to be called. I'll be announcing in advance who the next witnesses will be. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, while you'll be placed on a panel, I'll be calling individuals to testify one at a time. 
Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should raise use the raise hand function in Zoom. You'll be called on in the order with which you raised your hand after the panelist has completed testimony. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, and this includes both questions and answers. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. Please listen for that cue. All public testimony will be limited to two minutes. At the end of two minutes, please wrap up your comments so we can move to the next panelists. Please listen carefully and wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony as there is a slight delay with the muting. Written testimony can be submitted to testimony at council.nyc.gov. I'm now going to call on the following members of the administration to testify. DHS First Deputy Commissioner Molly Park, DOI Commissioner Margaret Garnett, and DSS Deputy Commissioner Aaron Drinkwater. I'll first read the oath, and after, I will call on each panelist here from the administration individually to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? DHS First Deputy Commissioner Molly Park. I do. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? DOI Commissioner Margaret Garnett. I do. Thank you. And finally, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? DSS Deputy Commissioner Aaron Drinkwater. I do. Thank you. First Deputy Commissioner Park, you may begin when ready. Thank you very much. Good morning. I would like to thank the City Council's Oversight and Investigations Committee, the General Welfare Committee, and their chairs for giving us the opportunity to testify. Today, we are here to speak about homeless service provider contracts and the work we have done to ensure shelter providers are true partners in making reforms to improve programs and services for New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. My name is Molly Park, and I am the first Deputy Commissioner of the New York City Department of Homeless Services. I am joined by my colleague, Aaron Drinkwater, Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Legislative Affairs at the New York City Department of Social Services. We wanna thank the City Council for your commitment to the safety and well-being of our clients. We value the Council's partnership and support as we work to ensure our staff and providers deliver the best possible services to vulnerable New Yorkers. The well being of our clients is of paramount importance to DHS and to me personally. What we have learned about Bronx Parent Housing Network is absolutely unacceptable. As I will discuss, DHS is taking affirmative steps to protect clients and prevent such situations in the future. We look forward to walking the committee through the policies and practices we have put in place to ensure our clients are safe and receive the services to which they are entitled. Under this administration, DHS has spearheaded several initiatives to strengthen the management and oversight of shelter programs with the end goal of improving the conditions experienced by our clients. Our multi-pronged approach to further support our not-for-profit providers has included reforming our contract process, updating our approach to funding and performance evaluations, improving shelter conditions through real-time tracking systems and strengthening quality assurance practices across the system. As we move forward, it is important to consider the background of our city's haphazardly developed shelter system, which was built over the last several decades as the city confronted a range of factors resulting in displacement across New York City. This environment resulted in increased shelter population, which compounded by underinvestment created challenges for DHS and providers as the agency sought to provide safe, clean and secure client conditions for clients. However, we are seeing that our strategies are starting to take hold and are headed in the right direction. For example, the shelter census for 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020 remained roughly flat year over year for the first time in more than a decade at approximately 60,000. And now the DHS st census stands below 50,000. Additionally, since the launch of Turning the Tide plan, we have already ended the use of more than 260 shelter buildings as part of our commitment to ending the use of Band-Aid measures of previous administrations, including the 21-year-old cluster program. 
We have cited 89 high quality borough based shelters of which 46 are already open, operational and providing high quality services and supports to New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. Additionally, our average days notice before opening stands at more than 200 days. And we have reduced our overall shelter footprint by 41%. With that, we would like to provide you with an overview of the initiatives DHS has taken on in collaboration with our providers to improve services for New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. Currently, DHS holds contracts with approximately 70 human service providers whose role is to provide services to New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. DHS has an open-ended RFP process to solicit new shelters, meaning that proposals from not-for-profit providers can be submitted on a rolling basis throughout the year. After a proposal is submitted, our program experts at DSS-DHS review, evaluate, and score the application in accordance with New York City's New York City Procurement Policy Board rules. This evaluation process involves assessing the need for the proposed shelter population, such as families with children, adult families, or single adults, the proposed location, the building's viability, the scope of the client's services, the provider's experience and their pricing, along with other operational factors. Moreover, RFP responses are also reviewed through the lens of our Turning the Tides borough-based shelter plan to ensure consistency and an equitable siting process. This ap approach has replaced the prior haphazard system in which shelter development was addressed on an ad hoc basis. As we have previously testified to the council, in order to ensure providers can deliver the high quality services required to help New Yorkers experiencing homelessness, and get back on their feet, DHS has invested upwards of a quarter of a billion dollars a year in additional funding for our not-for-profit providers to address decades of disinvestment. These efforts also include modernizing the outdated rates providers have been paid over the years. This overhaul includes funding for social workers in contracted families with children's shelters, housing specialists in all shelters, and standardizing rates for shelter services. As we develop the funding parameters of the services that our partners provide, a model evolved, hence the term model budget. The model budget efforts to rationalize shelter provider rates for contracted providers follows the city's 90-day review reforms. In 2016, following the recommendations from the 90-day review, DHS worked with stakeholders from the shelter provider community, oversight agencies, and other experts to develop budget guidelines. This reform initiative was reported on by the New York State Comptroller's Office when in a 2017 controller audit, DHS was commended for developing the model budget tool. DHS began to use the model budget template in 2017 to phase in the rate reform for existing shelter providers through a process that includes negotiation with providers and a budget amendment process. Separately, the New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, or OTDA, reviews and approves budgets for tier two family shelters. This process has also been used for providers proposing new shelter sites. As of today, the model budget process is nearly complete with three model budget, budget amendments yet to be registered. All three remaining amendments are pending due to reasons outside control, the control of the agency. After providers submit a budget proposal using the standard template, the DHS Shelter Program Budget Office compares the proposed budgets to the model and then proceeds to review with DHS program staff. This process is completed in close consultation with each shelter provider. From there, DHS sends a recommended budget to the DSS Finance Office and the New York City Office of Management and Budget for approval. Once the recommendations move forward, the contract proceeds to the amendment phase, which includes legal review and eventually ending with registration at the City Comptroller's Office. We have also worked closely with our provider partners to update performance evaluations so that together we can raise the quality of the services we provide to New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. The updated shelter performance approach includes an important management evaluation process to help both DHS and our providers measure the most critical indicators that show whether our investments are paying off. Our investment in the not-for-profit sector has strengthened our work with providers addressing historic underinvestments and working to ensure providers are able to meet standards across the system. The model budget and performance evaluations are intended to make sure that our investments and our expectations are aligned so that our clients are able to receive high quality services in a healthy and safe environment. Through this collaborative process, we have heard positive feedback from our provider partners 
as they have expressed their desire to access information to manage and further improve their services. The challenge of homelessness didn't occur overnight and it won't be solved overnight, but our city's comprehensive strategies are taking hold and we are committed to continually finding ways to do better for the New Yorkers we serve. Additionally, we work with shelter providers to provide trainings on various topics, ranging from language access, using trauma-informed approaches to service delivery and cultural sensitivity. These periodic trainings help equip our providers with the knowledge and tools they need to deliver the best possible supports to our clients. Moving on to shelter conditions, DHS typically conducts routine site review inspections or RSRIs to review current violations at shelters as well as conditions that may become problematic over time. RSRIs are part of the contracting process and providers must show steps towards addressing any problematic conditions at existing sites before DHS can submit a shelter contract for registration. The shelter director is required to submit a corrective action plan to DHS detailing the steps needed to address shelter conditions identified in the RSRI. The mayor also established the Shelter Repair Squad, a multi-agency task force to inspect shelter buildings and identify code violations requiring repair. At least two times per year, each task force agency will inspect facilities for code violations and inform shelter providers of the results. A critical component of the Shelter Repair Squad is the ability for the city to track all shelter building violations, along with measuring the progress made towards mitigating the identified issues. To drive this task, the city developed a system to report on all city shelters and every violation associated with each building. Essentially, the system acts as a real-time tracker for shelter building violations, allowing the city to appropriately allocate shelter repair squad staff to work with providers to inspect buildings and develop and implement remediation plans. As a proof of the utility of this system, the framework has since been adopted by the state to develop their statewide shelter management system which allows our state oversight agency to more efficiently monitor building systems by tracking the status, remediation, and life cycle of deficiencies and their responses by providers and users. Information is aggregated from various sources available to DHS to provide a central clearinghouse where users retrieve information about shelters or evaluate and track the status of repairs at shelters. This approach facilitates interagency collaboration in improving conditions in shelters and makes it possible to formulate the monthly shelter repair scorecard, which publicly reports on the conditions of homeless shelter facilities. The scorecard helps define the scope of any problems by publicly listing conditions at all homeless shelters in New York City. As part of our ongoing effort to transform a haphazard shelter system that was built up over decades, we are continuing to examine the performance of all our service providers to ensure New Yorkers experiencing homelessness are receiving the appropriate services and supports they need to get back on their feet. These ongoing transformation efforts include phasing out certain providers who do not meet our high standards of service and care and our comprehensive review of all, product, all providers and contracts continues. For example, in this administration, we've ended the city's relationship with various providers. This started with We Always Care and Housing Bridge, who had a history of serious shelter conditions or other issues. We then announced actions we had taken against Bushwick Economic Development Corporation, also known as BEDCO, phasing out all their commercial hotels, cluster shelters, and traditional shelters, so that they are no longer a shelter provider of any kind. Over the last year, with the assistance of a court-appointed receiver, which we went to court to obtain, we have completely phased out Children's Community Services, CCS, as a DHS shelter provider. At their peak, CCS had a very large shelter footprint, mostly in commercial hotels, providing more than 15% of the families with children capacity necessary to meet our legal requirements to provide shelter. Our efforts to phase out this provider unequivocally demonstrate that no provider is too big to fail or able to avoid accountability. In the case of, of Excuse me. In the case of Bronx Parent Housing Network, we have used our compliance tools to try to ensure this provider remained on the right track. When DHS had a concern about their operations, we required a corrective action plan, a cap. When Bronx Parent proposed increasing their share of units, we considered their apparent attempts to comply with that cap, use the contracting process to adjust their portfolio and more effectively right-size their capacity, giving them fewer beds and fewer shelters than they proposed. 
In accordance with the city's procurement policy board rules, this process was conducted while also evaluating new proposals submitted on their merits, including potential positive impact on clients in immediate need, such as to provide isolation services to clients recovering from COVID-19 or COVID-like illness. This work is a delicate balancing act. We are four years into addressing a problem that built up over 40 years, overhauling the way we do business top to bottom, including removing non-compliant providers and building a bench of qualified and experienced new providers, while also meeting our legal and moral obligation to shelter all those who need it every single night. At the same time, we work to correct conditions across providers. We must also work together on the, on the ground with provider staff who are trying to do the right thing and improve the daily lives of those we serve. It is important to stress that not every oversight indicates corruption. Not every misdisclosure means there is a bad actor. And our first response is to work with providers to understand the issues that exist and see if we can help, since our clients depend on continuity of services. It is also essential to distinguish between the actions of select executive leaders and the work performed by dedicated frontline staff who every day try to do the right thing, provide services and programs to those in need and help individuals and families get back on their feet. In the case of Bronx Parent, we took several immediate steps in response to recent developments, which include uh, first appointed an interim Bronx Parent CEO. Effective February 10th, 2021, Daniel Teets was appointed as interim chief executive officer of BPHN. As you know, Mr. Teets was the court appointed receiver for Children's Community Services and has successfully managed the wind down of its operations while continuing to provide essential shelter and services to clients. While Mr. Teets was not court appointed as a receiver by agreement with Bronx Parent, as interim CEO, he has full authority to run the organization, including the authority to remove or add board members. He's accountable to DSS, not to the board of Bronx Parent, which has no power to remove him. Uh, second, we launched an independent investigation of Bronx Parent. On February 24th, 2021, the New York City Department of Investigation released a request for proposals for an independent integrity monitor to investigate Bronx Parent under the direction of DOI. The selected integrity monitor, Kroll Associates, will investigate the actions, conduct, operations, or emissions of Bronx Parent or any of its current or former key people, employees, subcontractors, consultants, suppliers, vendors, and affiliated businesses with a focus on issues including, but not limited to, employment practices, including sexual harassment, abuse, and assault, conflicts of interest, related party transactions, and compliance with its 2018 CAP and city procurement policies. Aside from an internal investigation that will be conducted by the integrity monitor, the firm will also be retained for a total of two years to ensure that Bronx Parent maintains compliance with the cap, as well as a supplemental monitorship agreement that Bronx Parent will enter with DOI. The engagement will be jointly managed by DOI and DSS. Uh, third, we initiated a review surveying practices across providers. In addition to the above investigation, DSS reminded all DHS providers of their legal obligations regarding appropriate corporate structure, accountability and transparency, and has requested responses to a survey prepared jointly by DOI and DSS regarding their policies and practices in key areas. DSS has also worked with DOI to prepare a second competitive solicitation for an independent organization to review all DSS providers with respect to their policies and practices in certain key areas, including, but not limited to, employment practices, including sexual harassment, abuse, and assault, related party transactions, and conflicts of interest. The information provided in response to the survey will enable a more targeted review of any specific areas of concern as appropriate. Uh, fourth, we strengthened sexual harassment reporting protocols. Uh, DH DSS has clarified and strengthened its protocols with respect to contracted providers around the reporting and investigation of allegations of sexual harassment. Specifically, in addition to alerting the shelter director, program administrator, social service director, program analyst, and organization's board, claims of sexual misconduct or harassment involving senior leadership must be reported to DSS, which will then determine an appropriate mechanism for investigating the claims in consultation with DOI. 
At our facilities, we are committed to providing all those New Yorkers who we serve with information on the extensive resources available to them and how to access them. To that end, we have reminded DHS providers that under Local Law 95 for the year 2018, they are required to display and distribute information to clients regarding what clients can do if they have been sexually assaulted or harassed. And under Local Law 96 for the year 2018, they are required to ensure all employees have received anti-sexual harassment training. The City's Commissioner on Human Rights makes this training available online. Moreover, as discussed and recommended at this year's DSS preliminary budget hearing, we have developed an informational flyer for clients who express that they have experienced sexual harassment or abuse to our staff or provider staff to advise them of how they can get support and assistance. Uh, let me now turn to the legislation. Introduction 2284 would amend the administrative code by establishing a framework for survivor-centered response by DSS when DSS receives complaints of sexual assault or harassment. DSS supports the intent of the bill and looks forward to working with the sponsor in supporting clients by referring and connecting survivors to resources. As indicated above, DSS developed a procedure and flyer for shelter staff and intake staff at DSS, DHS, and HRA to distribute to clients who express that they have experienced sexual harassment or abuse. Overall, the administration has made comprehensive and concerted efforts to address years of underinvestment in the infrastructure of the shelter system with a combination of immediate investments alongside top to bottom organizational improvement reforms. There is still work to be done, and we look forward to partnering with the Council to help families and individuals experiencing homelessness get back on their feet in a safe, secure, and clean environment. Taken together, Introduction 2056A and Introduction 2285 appear to be intended to strengthen provider accountability and contracting, specifically calling for personnel to report corruption, cooperate with investigations, and address conflicts and misconduct. We take our responsibility to protect clients, monitor performance and safeguard public funds very seriously and agree with the apparent goals of the bill. The city has a robust process for assessing vendor integrity, which requires integrity, financial and potential conflicts, self-disclosures through procurement systems as a prerequisite to contract registration. City contracts require full and accurate disclosure and cooperation with any potential investigations, which are in alignment with the goals of these bills. This information is considered as part of the vendor background and uh, vendor background check process. The passport system implemented by MOX also gives agencies a historical view into vendor performance evaluations and any cautions that emerge from prior contracting, which further enhance background check reviews. In the case where a vendor is struggling to meet the performance requirements of a contract, on a case-by-case -case basis, agencies may refer, prefer to enter into a cap to build their capacity before taking the final measure of terminating the contract. This, is a, this existing legal and oversight framework helps to surface and correct issues as we have shared earlier in our testimony, but we will always look for opportunities to do more. The administration looks forward to working with the sponsors to identify meaningful new actions that we, we might take to achieve desired goals. I will now turn it over to Commissioner Garnett and look forward to answering any questions you may have following her testimony. Thanks very much. Good morning, Chair Gibson and Chair Levin and members of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations and the Committee on General Welfare. My name is Margaret Garnett and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Investigation. Thank you for inviting me to address the committee today to offer some context about DOI's oversight of shelter providers contracted by the city's Department of Social Services and to respond to any questions you may have about that oversight. Additionally, I appreciate the opportunity to speak briefly on the concerns DOI has regarding intro 2292, which would expand the public reporting requirements related to DOI's investigations and to offer our commitment to work with council members to refine that legislation. Let me start by discussing DOI's oversight of nonprofit contractors, specifically DSS providers, and DOI's role in rooting out fraud and strengthening internal controls as it relates to city funding of these entities. For more than a decade, DOI has focused resources in this area, regularly conducting investigations that hold individuals accountable for crimes and other wrongdoing. 
At the same time, DOI has worked to safeguard city funds, identify gaps in city agencies' internal controls, and recommend ways to strengthen those controls to prevent fraud from occurring. Conducting criminal investigations, monitoring nonprofit providers, and issuing recommendations to city agencies to close corruption gaps are part of the multi-pronged approach that DOI takes in combating corruption, particularly as it relates to fraud at city-funded nonprofits. Pursuant to Executive Order 64, issued March 3rd, 2021, DOI will also have a new role in ensuring that the city's human services contractors take appropriate steps to investigate and address allegations of sexual harassment made against the chief executive officer or an equivalent principal of their organization. Specifically, the executive order requires that city agencies amend their human services contracts to require contractors to transmit to DOI certain information, including a copy of any complaint or allegation of sexual harassment or retaliation on the basis of such a complaint brought by any person against the chief executive officer or equivalent principal of the organization, as well as a copy of the final determination or judgment with regard to any such complaint. Contractors retain all of their obligations as both employers and service providers to prevent sexual harassment and to investigate and address all complaints of sexual harassment accordingly. DOI's role, working with the contracting agency as appropriate, will be to ensure that contractors meet their obligations and handle such complaints appropriately, even when the complaint is against the leader of the organization. As has been publicly reported, DOI has an ongoing investigation into financial improprieties at Bronx Parent Housing Network that was well in process in 2020 and has already resulted in federal criminal charges against one defendant. Because this is an ongoing and active criminal matter, I cannot provide further details at this time. Alongside this ongoing investigation, DOI has also been working with DSS to strengthen oversight of Bronx Parent Housing Network, including retaining a monitor that will report directly to DOI and provide additional oversight in two specific ways. First, the monitor will conduct an internal investigation of BPHN, examining in particular the nonprofit's policies and practices around sexual misconduct allegations, and more broadly, examining BPHN subcontractors and their relationship to its former CEO. Once that review is completed, the monitor will then focus on BPHN's ongoing compliance with the terms of its city contracts, which is a more traditional type of integrity monitorship. In addition, DOI and DSS are working to retain an independent monitor that will also report directly to DOI and will conduct an audit of all nonprofit homeless shelter providers with city contracts, providing greater oversight of how this nonprofit sector is using city dollars and complying with city requirements designed to prevent fraud. I'd like to turn now to briefly address intro 2292, which proposes amendments to the city's whistleblower law. DOI fully supports efforts to encourage the reporting to DOI of wrongdoing by both city contractors and subcontractors, as well as city employees. One of the strongest defenses against the pernicious impact of corruption are individuals who are willing to step forward and report it. Providing a safe and confidential place to report wrongdoing and conducting thorough investigations of these allegations while also treating the targets of allegations fairly are all central to DOI's mission. The amendments proposed in intro 2292, however, in our view are likely to discourage the reporting of corruption to DOI and undermine our ability to fairly and thoroughly investigate those reports. DOI's annual whistleblower letter provides foundational information about our whistleblower investigations without compromising complainants or ongoing investigations. Legislation recently enacted by the City Council will enhance those reporting indices in the annual report we will file later this year, specifically the number of reports that come from city employees under subsection B of the whistleblower statute, the number of reports concerning wrongdoing from city contractors, and more detailed information about DOI's investigations of complaints of retaliation. Intro 2292 would vastly expand DOI's reporting mandate to list all reports of wrongdoing from city employees and city contractors, attributing each complaint to a particular agency or contractor, as well as providing the status of each of those cases individually, including open and ongoing investigations. And while the law states that any personally identifiable information could be redacted, 
the act of linking specific complainants and complaints to an agency or contractor, along with providing the status and outcome of each matter, could provide enough specific information to identify complainants and potential witnesses. The law also does not take into account that a closed matter is not necessarily a substantiated one. Public reporting of the information called for by the bill would provide just enough information about city employee complainants to spark conjecture and potentially a hunt to find who the complainants are, which would of course be particularly detrimental to active and ongoing investigations, but would also be damaging in closed cases. Moreover, publicizing subjects of investigations that are not yet concluded or where we do not substantiate the allegations is deeply unfair and could result in negative consequences for those targets when such consequences are not supported by any evidence or facts. This kind of public reporting will have a potential chilling effect on all of DOI's work and would rightly give pause to individuals who may want to step forward to report corruption. An investigative agency like DOI must have the ability to work confidentially on investigations and to speak publicly on them only when we have reached conclusions based on the evidence and the law. I take transparency seriously and understand its value in better understanding and monitoring the work and impact of law enforcement. That is why my administration at DOI has taken steps to increase the type of information available to the public about what DOI does, including developing an accurate and comprehensive public database that catalogs our policy and procedure recommendations to city agencies and reports on their status, as well as posting publicly for the first time our whistleblower law annual letters and our annual anti-corruption report that provides detailed citywide insight into agencies' anti-corruption programs. But our obligation to protect complainants who report wrongdoing to DOI, as well as to safeguard information about individuals under investigation or where our investigations do not result in substantiated findings, are also part of DOI's mission and one we must carefully balance with the benefits of transparency. Those are best practices and allow DOI to conduct its work with integrity and fidelity to the law. DOI follows the facts in its investigations wherever they lead, but we speak publicly only on substantiated facts and confirmed conclusions. To do otherwise would jeopardize our ability to use all available investigative tools, could expose complainants and witnesses who deserve confidentiality for as long as we can provide it, and would unfairly taint the subject of an investigation where DOI's findings did not ultimately support the allegations. Striking a measured balance between transparency and carrying out investigations ethically and under best practices are attributes that I know this committee respects and understands. DOI is committed to working with you to achieve those goals and refine this bill to best represent those interests and protect our investigations. Thank you for this time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you to Deputy First Deputy Commissioner Molly Park and Commissioner Margaret Garnett. Thank you so much for testifying on behalf of DSS and DOI. I'd like to acknowledge we've also been joined by Council Member Mark Traeger. And I just have several questions. And I guess I'll start with DSS just to understand some general uh, procedures that we currently have on the books. And I recognize that a lot of the work you talked about Deputy Commissioner has been as a result of the executive order. And I guess that's one of the reasons why, you know, colleagues and I are just deeply concerned. I don't know if we would be having this conversation had the New York Times article not been published, right? And so it just reminds me that we have to continue to look at discrepancies and gaps in services and make sure that we tighten up our procedures as best we can. So I acknowledge a lot of the work that DSS has done, a lot of changes in policies and procedures to really provide uh, more of a, an accountability from our providers who we entrust to provide these critical services. So generally speaking, uh, you talked a little bit about this in your testimony. What is the current process for handling sexual assault complaints made by clients of shelters? Are there differences in the reporting if it's coming against the CEO versus a lower level staff member at an administrative level or any other capacity. And I'd like to understand if there is a difference and how do we get that information out to the providers 
who in turn will share that with clients. Absolutely. So uh, an allegation that is uh, against a lower level staff person, the shelter is up or sorry, whoever receives the complaint, it could be a shelter staff person, it could be the DSS ombuds in the office, but wherever the complaint is received, they are obligated to inform the shelter staff, the program administrator, which is the, the uh, person with the data, DHS staff person with the day-to-day -day oversight and engagement with the shelter, uh, and, and other leadership within the organization. Um, that, the, the, that claim is investigated at that level. If there is an allegation that is against either the CEO of the organization or any other senior principal, there is also an obligation to report it to DSS where we are going to take it to our legal department and to the Department of Investigation. Um, that is that has been reiterated to all of our providers um, very recently. I think I can pull the date, but it was in, uh, I believe, mid-March. We sent out information to reiterate that policy. We continue to, to reinforce that with our providers. Um, the, the bottom line is that absolutely an allegation that is that is that involves a senior leader of an organization has to be treated very seriously and will go to DOI. Okay, and how often does DSS follow up with providers to ensure that that information has been given to clients? And then the second part of that question is, I wonder how we deal with language access with clients who do not speak English as a primary language. Do we ensure that that information is translated in a way that in which they can understand? Yes, all of our documentation, when we put out client notices, we absolutely translate those um, to the, the seven languages that the city is, requires. Um, and we use the language line or other resources when we uh, are working with a client who speaks uh, a language where there might not be uh, automatic translation there. Um, you know, we do, I think I mentioned in my testimony, we do a lot of training, a lot of reinforcement with our providers. Um, so the reinforcing the message around sexual harassment training, making sure that providers are, are doing the annual training, that is absolutely something that we do. Um, we have quarterly meetings with all executive directors where this is an opportunity to reinforce these kinds of messages. That's at the, the senior most level. There are regular meetings between uh, with the shelter directors, there are regular meetings with uh, lower level shelter staff. So throughout the organization, throughout the DHS organization, we really emphasize uh, communication, transparency, flow of information. This is absolutely something that's important. It is absolutely something we will continue to reinforce. Okay, um, within the Times investigation, it was made aware that there was a client that reported um, a case of sexual harassment by, uh, you know, the particular CEO. And DHS has acknowledged that that complaint was not appropriately escalated to agency leadership. Now you've talked about a series of steps that have now been implemented to address that. But could I ask in, in terms of this particular instance, um, how did this type of thing happen? So, you know, we, we educate, we do outreach, we do as much as we can to make sure that everyone understands the rules. But I understand we're all humans and we do make mistakes. But you know, this type of error uh, and acknowledging that it was not escalated in such a way, it, it just doesn't make sense to us that a case of sexual abuse would be referred back to the particular provider. It just seems that something went very wrong here in this process. Yeah. Um, as you know, we have publicly acknowledged that this case was not handled appropriately. Uh, okay. We have worked with the, the Ombudsman's office. We have worked with other DHS, DSS staff to reinforce the appropriate protocols. Uh, we have revised those protocols to, to strengthen, strengthen those. Um, I, you know, personally was part of, of many conversations, making sure that those protocols, which are in fact written documentation, right, are, are thorough and complete and that all of the staff that might come in contact with that have the appropriate training. 
Okay. And I just had a, a quick question about the relationship that we have with OTADA and other agencies like the State Division of Human Rights. Um, if clients go directly to the state and file uh, reports of alleged misconduct and or abuse, how would that be handled as a city agency? Is there any MOU, any partnership that we have with the state where they, number one, are mandated to report to us that a client in our system has filed a report, but is there anything that we can do to strengthen that partnership with the state? So there is no mandated reporting at this time. We have reached out to OTDA, to our oversight agency, to help with that, um, to look for ways that we might be able to create that kind of reporting relationship. I think certainly if the council was interested in, in passing a resolution calling for that, it could also be helpful. Okay, and I appreciate you saying that. I think it's a little disturbing that it's taken so long that we don't have that particular memorandum of understanding because these were clients that went directly to the state. We had no knowledge of it. Um, it was acknowledged by the state, but there was no mandate that forced them to let the city of New York know that one of our clients and our residents filed a report. So we will further have conversations around that. Look forward to that. Okay. Um, any individual that's seeking city services, how are they made aware of how to report an incident involving sexual assault or harassment? Um, so are they given this information as they enter shelter services while they're going through the assessment as they exit? How does that work today? Yep, uh, people are given information at, at intake as they come into the system. There are, there's notices posted in shelters um, and I want to really thank Council Member Rosenthal, who in, in our preliminary budget hearing suggested that we create a resource guide flyer for, for individuals who may be sexual assault survivors. Uh, we have done so, that has been distributed. That will also be given to people as they come into the system as well as posted in, the, in shelters. So yes, the information is available and made available to clients. Okay, and then I think this is a tough question, but how do we give assurance and confidence to clients that if they do come forward with a report that their identity is confidential, uh, that their safety is going to be protected? Um, and you know, there is a culture in our shelter system. And I think many of my colleagues are aware of it because we hear from clients ourselves, and so do you, that you know, no one wants to be known as a snitch. No one wants to come forward by themselves. There could be others that are experiencing the same type of abuse and just not want to come forward. Um, just as we have these conversations in the world of domestic violence and intimate partner violence, um, it's, it's challenging to give clients that reassurance. Um, so what can we do as an agency to assure clients that their identity will be protected and they're safe and they don't have to fear discrimination or retaliation? Absolutely. So I think a couple of answers. I think the first is that there are multiple pathways for reporting. Um, in some, for some people, they might have a close relationship with a caseworker or other staff person at the shelter. That is absolutely a pathway that they can use to report uh, instances, and 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 the shelter staff are are trained and required to report that up and out. But that you know is a that is a building on the personal relationships that already exist is for some people the most comfortable way to do it. Uh, for other individuals, um, having it a step removed from the place where they live is, is the most comfortable option. And we do have an ombudsman's office that is uh, independent, available by phone, um, during business hours, it's actually DSS staff that answer it. It is transferred via 311 when it's not business hours, but, but there is this independent body that can uh, accept, accept complaints, accept uh, notifications, and get those to the right place for investigation. So whether somebody prefers something that is removed or something that is personal relationship, both pathways exist. Um, the other thing that I really want to mention is that we do have a, a process within the DHS shelter system to um, facilitate safety transfers. Um, they can be used in this instance or in other circumstances. Um, but uh, if somebody believes 
feels unsafe in their existing shelter, we have a we have a defined pathway to help them transfer to an alternative shelter, taking into account all of that household's needs, right? If it's a family, the child's school district, if it's a family that has experienced domestic violence, we wanna make sure that they are not in an area where their, their abuser might be. So it's a, it's a complicated process, but we absolutely can, can transfer somebody to a place where they feel safer if that's what they desire. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned that, Commissioner, because it is a complicated process. And I think because of that, a lot of clients don't always want to come forward because when they do request a transfer, you have to match them up with their particular borough, their, uh, in terms of their children in the local school district, safety measures, uh, paperwork. There's a lot that clients have to go through. So I'm wondering if a client comes forward with that type of allegation and confides in a caseworker, case manager, and does request that transfer, how can we make it easier for them to transfer so that it's not uh, you know, inundated with paperwork and just all this bureaucratic red tape so they can actually move and be safe? Right. Uh, I mean, first of all, let me say we take the safety transfer process very seriously, whether it is around sexual assault or any other reason for, for a safety transfer because they do come up in other contexts as well. Um, and we, we act on those very promptly, taking into account the different dynamics that I mentioned, we do, we do act promptly. Um, I think a very key answer to that, frankly, lies in, in the larger turning the tide goals of making sure that we have a sufficient high quality shelter capacity in different parts of the city, right? When we are operating at, at a more or less full capacity and we are you know tapping into less than ideal shelter capacity like commercial hotels, it is harder to move a household to the to the setting that is right for them. Um, but one of the things that I think we have done with the Turning the Tide plan is to really focus on taking down less than ideal capacity and to developing a strong pipeline of, of high quality shelters with high quality providers. That means when somebody needs to be transferred, there can be an option that is appropriate for them and that, that is already vacant, right? We're not looking to, to move multiple families to be able to do that. So. Um, I realize the, the shelter pipeline may feel somewhat removed, but I think the work that we have done to develop more units of high quality shelter is, is really important to the question that you ask. Okay, I agree with you. Can you expand a little bit on the ombudsman unit? You said that it is an independent unit uh, that gets referrals from the 311 system. Um, who does the staff work for? How often do they operate? And what is their protocol for referring any calls that come into the unit? Sure. So this is a, a division of DSS, the Department of Social Services. Okay. Um, they operate a, a hotline essentially to take any kind of call from a DHS or DSS in HRA client, right, reporting a, con a concern of any type, right? So this is not specific to, to sexual harassment or uh, discrimination. It is, it can be, you know, a slew of different, I need help with a particular benefit. I need this, right? Somebody who um, either isn't sure where to go or, um, you know, may not have the personal relationships for whatever reason at their shelter, perhaps they're new to the shelter, perhaps they prefer a certain level of anonymity. So it's an, a wide range of calls that they accept. Um, it is, it's DSS staff, they answer, it's a direct hotline during business hours. If calls come in outside of normal business hours, they are routed through 311, but ultimately followed up by ombudsman staff. Okay, so in terms of clients, they would call 311 or call the ombudsman unit directly? They can call the ombudsman number directly. Uh, if you're interested, we're certainly happy to provide you with that number. Either I can send it over email if that's easier or, or okay. record. Okay, and they're given this number at intake as well during the whole assessment period? Uh, I am relatively- or is it upon request? Uh, it, it is a number that is publicized, but let me get back to you with exactly all the forms that we, ways that we make that number available. 
Okay. I just had two questions about the executive order. I wanted to understand that a little bit more um, because the way that we're understanding it is that providers are still required to investigate complaints of sexual harassment on their own uh, and that DOI would then review the provider's handling of that particular complaint. So I wanted to understand, is that an accurate assessment of the executive order? Uh, because the mayor indicated that non-for-profits should not handle their own sexual assault investigations on their own. So if, if that's not accurate, could you just explain it a little bit more so we understand what the process is when a complaint does come in? Sure, um, oh. I will answer and, and my colleague would like to jump in as well and I okay. certainly appreciate that. Um, any allegation that is against a principal of the organization, right? The executive director, CEO, other comparable leadership is going to be investigated independently. Um, if it is an, invest, uh, an allegation against lower level staff, right? A caseworker for a security guard, that can be investigated at the organizational level. So I, um, I, I don't mean to contradict, um, my colleague from DSS, but that, that's, I think DOI's understanding is the same um, as your understanding, Chair Gibson, that the, because all the shelter providers are in employers as well as service providers, they have an obligation under the law to have an EEO process um, and to follow it when they have allegations against any staff member, including the head of the organization. The extra layer of protection that's provided in the EEO is that when the organization has such an allegation that where the, um, the alleged harasser is the head of the organization, whatever name they give to that person, they have to inform DOI that they have such an allegation, the process they're gonna follow, and then the results of that investigation. And DOI has oversight over how did they conduct the investigation? What was the outcome? Was that appropriate? And we can take any further steps after that point that we deem appropriate. The intent is not to displace the provider's own legal obligations, whether as an employer or a service provider, to have a process and to handle complaints appropriately. It just adds an extra layer of supervision when, in the most sensitive matters, when the allegation is against the head of the organization. Thank, thank you for the clarification. If, if I can jump in on that. DSS will be investigating cases when the allegation is against a leader of the organization. So the that investigation will not be left to the organization alone. We, as an as an agency, will be involved in that process. That's uh, specific to DSS. So I cannot speak to how other agencies might be interpreting the EO, but that is our policy. Okay, and I guess that's the reason why I asked the question because it is a it's very disturbing to even think that the homeless services provider would be responsible for investigating uh, cases of misconduct within the organization from shelter clients. Uh, that level of oversight as a result of the executive order um, to me has to be tight and strengthened. Um, I worry about you know, allowing providers their own ability to investigate these particular cases. And again, I go back to the original comment I made when we talk about clients coming forward. These clients have to live in these shelters. Uh, many of them have nowhere else to go. And so if you make an allegation against the CEO, that is a serious allegation. And a lot of these clients are predominantly women and women of color and mothers with children, right? It is really hard to come forward and to make an allegation of that nature and think that no one re will retaliate against you. I can't emphasize that enough. And so that's why I'm asking, you know, we have to give the assurance, the confidence that they're going to be protected and safe. There is this culture that CEOs of, you know, many of our not-for-profits, they're the leaders, right? They're in charge. But if you have a leader that abuses their power and takes advantage of clients and creates that atmosphere, one of which is harassing in nature, clients are not going to come forward. That's just the way it is, right? They don't want to lose their space. They don't want to lose their bed. They don't want to be on the street. Right. And that's the reality that we all see in our district. So, you know, this to me, 
I, I need to further understand this because it, it makes me feel a little uncertain knowing that under the EO, they're still investigating uh, claims of misconduct and sexual abuse in their own organization, even though there is a level of oversight. I worry about what that looks like on the ground. And Chair Gibson, if I could just step into one thing I think that's worth clarifying, and um, this is really building on what Molly said earlier, um, is that the EO, what the what the EO, I think, as DOI understand it, is intended to add an additional layer of oversight when the organization itself is the first recipient of the allegation. Um, so it doesn't mean that agencies will be referring those allegations back. And I think one of the things that um, DHS has done and that I would hope other agencies would do as well is to create, publicize, work to have a variety of places where um, clients in particular who, you know, because the EO deals with both um, clients and employees, but where clients in particular have a variety of places to go with their complaints so they don't feel that their only option is to report it to the provider. So I think the the EO in, in that sense is, is relatively narrow in scope in that where a victim has chosen to go to the provider and the object of the, the defendant or target of their complaint is the head of the organization, those are particularly sensitive situations that need additional oversight. And I think parallel to that, separate from the EO, the other measures that have been taken, um, whether that's to go to special victims division, to the mm -hmm. agency's ombudsperson, to social workers, to other providers to make that report is I think equally important. So there's multiple ways of addressing the concern that you've raised, which I think is a really valid one. Um, but I think the EO is dealing, that part of the EO is dealing only with sort of this narrow piece. And then there's many other things that can and are being done to provide other places where victims can go, where they might feel more comfortable going rather than the organization itself. Okay, I understand, I appreciate that. And I also think, again, that's why it's important to make sure information is available so that clients know what alternatives they have and what options they have going to the NYPD, calling 311. I mean, many of these entities, we've worked so closely and so hard. Just as an example, Council Member Rosenthal knows, NYPD Special Victims Division. We have tried so hard to transform that entire unit from the investigators to the detectives, to the safe spaces, to the you know centers where many clients go so they feel comfortable. Because the reality is it takes a lot of strength and a lot of bravery for anyone to come forward and bring this type of allegation against a staff member at any level. Uh, many clients feel it's embarrassed, embarrassing, they're ashamed, they don't wanna come forward, they don't wanna be double victimized again, right? And so we know we have to create that environment and that safe space for them to feel comfortable and strengthen and know that we are here, we're sympathetic, we understand, and we're going to give them that outlet. Um, another question I have is, Upon reporting the complainant to DSS, are providers supposed to initiate the investigation or do they wait for guidance from DSS? How does that work? So again, if it is a lower level staff person, absolutely, they should initiate the, the investigation. If the complaint is against a senior staff person, a leader of the organization, um, DSS will be playing a direct role and engaging with the board, right? Because the job of the or of a not-for-profit board is to provide that kind of oversight. So um, we will be investigating, but we will also be coordinating with the board, uh, not with the person against whom the, the claim is, is levied, of course. Okay. Um, is there any reason why the, the scope of both the required reporting to DSS and DOI's review why it's limited to only the allegations made against the CEO and high level executive staff members. Are we trying to create a difference in the level of staffing as it relates to the allegations? Because you said, Molly, that the provider is responsible for overseeing the investigation if it's one of the administrative, I don't like to use the word lower level, but you get what I'm saying, the administrative staff or anyone else at, at that level. 
Um, are we creating this two-tiered system? Um, are we saying that all allegations against anyone at a provider, whether it's janitorial, custodial, secretarial, administrative, CEO, the deputy, the deputy's deputy, like every allegation we take seriously, but are we creating this two-tiered system where the reporting and the investigation would be treated differently? So we absolutely take every allegation seriously. I wanna start by saying that. Um, as the commissioner alluded, the expectation is, and, and which is part of the, the, the EO and the uh, review process that DHS is currently engaged in, right? Organizations need to have a sexual harassment policy, including a, a procedure for how uh, claims and allegations are investigated, right? The expectation is that the not-for-profit has strong policies and procedures in place to handle this. And, and it is their responsibility to implement those policies and procedures. I think the reason we have differentiated between leadership staff is that the concern that, that the organization really can't independently investigate its own leadership, that there is an inherent conflict there. Um, and so we are taking a different role and a different position there, but, but absolutely it is our expectation that our not-for-profit contractors have strong sexual harassment policies that include an investigation pathway. Okay, I, I hear you, I agree with you. I also think that it would be an inherent conflict of interest for any staff at any level. Uh, they are employed by that particular provider. They have a responsibility to provide services. And so I, I think we should treat everyone at the same level, but that's just my opinion. Um, I'm wondering about the findings of the survey that was done. I believe it was a joint survey, DOI and DSS sent a survey to all of the DHS providers requesting information about their existing employment practices, including sexual harassment, assault, any violations. Um, could you just provide us with some of the oversight of some of the things you found? Did you see that there was any patterns? Um, are most providers consistent with these type of, types of practices and policies? And are there areas that you saw for improvement? Responses are due June 15th. So we're gonna have to come back to you on that. Oh, okay. Okay, we have a little bit of time. Okay, interesting. Um, I have one more question before I turn it over to Chair Levin, and uh, this is a, a honestly just me just trying to understand, you know, how we move forward and, you know, obviously in the shadow of an ongoing active investigation of this particular provider, uh, the message that we send to all of our other providers. Um, there is a process by which some of our existing homeless service providers are on a, an enhanced review list uh, for infractions that could be minor, infractions that could be major, and a wealth of different things that it could be happening. Uh, they're on this list. As I understand, during the time in which a provider is on this list, there is a possibility that the city will award them with a brand new contract, uh, right? And so in the case of VPHN during the pandemic, I understand they were awarded an additional contract of $10 million. Do you think that this is a practice that we should maintain? Or do we say to ourselves that if an, a provider is on an enhanced review list for compliance issues, whether it's discrepancy, et cetera, et cetera, does it make sense to award them brand new contracts? So, you know, as you know, council member, there's a variety of reasons why a, an organization might have a corrective action plan. Mm -hmm. um, our first goal, whenever we identify an issue, uh, is to work with the organization to build their capacity. We want that not-for-profit to become a strong provider. Um, we want that organization to build on the connections that they have to the community. Um, the goal is to right the ship. Um, so the corrective action plan in its initial phase right, is really a tool to help build the capacity of the organization. And in fact, for a couple of the organizations that currently have, have CAPS with DSS, um, the issue is that they are relatively new and that we want to be helping them build the, uh, the organizational strength to be able to come, become a strong provider. 
Um, so, so the goal, we approach the cap with it from a perspective of what do we need to do working together to get, as I say, to right the ship, to get back on track. Um, a, when an organization submits a proposal for a new uh, site, we are considering the proposal on the merits, that's a requirement of, of procurement rules. And one of the pieces of that consideration is, are they complying with their cap? Um, so an organization that is that might have that that has that extra level of review, but is doing what they are supposed to do. Um, yes, we can move forward with an additional contract. Um, in the case of Bronx Parent, it was it appeared that Bronx Parent was complying with their cap. They had done a number of of taken a number of steps around uh, hiring a fiscal monitor. Um, changing their policies and procedures that were in compliance with the cap that we had put them on in 2018. Um, as soon as we got to the point where we realized in fact that they were very much not in compliance with their cap, we immediately halted all new business with them, including uh, taking back awards that had already been, been made. Okay, I appreciate that. I think we still should continue to talk about it because I don't think we should necessarily reward uh, providers while they're on the corrective action plan. I do agree we need to strengthen their structure, their operations, um, but for the sake of brand new contracts, I think that's something we should really look into. Uh, it's concerning for those that may be on their enhanced review corrective action plan list for more serious allegations, but I, I think it sends a message. Number one, we don't have a lot of providers within the, you know, the uh, arena in which we contract with and then the second part of it is that we wanna make sure that while they are addressing those issues, they're not given a brand new contract. Uh, I could understand waiting until they're off that corrective action plan. That makes sense to me, but while they're on there, I just find that to be very uh, troubling to me. Chair, if I, if I could just say one thing briefly on that point. I, I think one concern that, that DOI would have just to add to, uh, as you move forward in considering these issues, is that given, as you noted, that in, in a number of social service arenas, there's a limited number of providers. Mm -hmm. I think DOI has um, often recommends to agencies that they enter into corrective action plans with a provider that we've reviewed. And my concern would just be that we not create disincentives for agencies who have a limited number of choices. We don't wanna disincentivize them to undertake corrective action and put um, providers under review for fear that they won't be able to continue to uh, use their services or give them new contracts because there really are a range of issues um, from capacity all the way to serious fraud that could lead to a corrective action plan. So I think they have a really useful role and I would just uh, from DOI's perspective I think not want to disincentivize agencies to take those steps um, for fear that they won't be able to use the vendor in the future. Okay, <clears throat> thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I, I definitely acknowledge that, you know, during this period of an investigation with BPHN, speaking from the perspective of representing Bronx County, um, I appreciate that these services have continued. Um, what I never want to do is send a message that uh, any CEO or leader of a non-for-profit uh, and their actions are reflective of the entire staff. And there are hardworking staff at BPHN and many others that may be on the corrective action plan that do their work every day, go to work with the commitment to serve um, and, and provide the critical services that clients need. Uh, and so I appreciate, you know, Commissioner Steve Banks and, and your team for not penalizing the entire staff. The services that must be provided will continue. And I think it gives us an uh, ability to provide more oversight to ensure that the services provided are of quality. Um, and so I, I just wanted to acknowledge that on behalf of you know, my county of the Bronx, because I do have many, many family and individual shelters that are operated by a number of providers. And I do acknowledge that you know, those residents do deserve our uh, services. So I thank you for that. Um, I will turn it over to my co-chair, but I wanna acknowledge the presence of council member Rafael Salamanca Jr. Thank you colleagues for joining us. And I turn this hearing over to co-chair Steve Levin. Thank you again.
Thank you very much, Chair Gibson. I, I greatly appreciate you covering for me. I'm, uh, back home, kids are <laughs> um, uh, safe in the other room. Um, uh, so uh, first question, just as a um, following up on a couple of Councilmember Gibson's questions. Um, so when, when in, in a shelter, in a D, uh, DSS run shelter, is there a, um, a flyer right in the, um, uh, you know, doorway or vestibule, um, right at the, at the entrance in the front door that says, if you, you know, if you want to report misconduct, call this confidential number? We have certainly, yes. Um, every shelter's physical geography differs a little bit. So I'm gonna, you know, not on the record say that it is necessarily in the vestibule, but yes, those are the, that is information that is, um, that is widely distributed and posted. Okay, in big letters, like the way that um, uh, DOI has their very compelling um, uh, flyers up that, that in city agencies that uh, instruct people to, uh, on how to report uh, misconduct? Uh, yes, and I think we'd be happy to get you copies of, of what is posted. Okay. Um, so, uh, I want to ask us a couple of questions about how we're approaching these issues um, systematically. Um, I think, as you know, first deputy commissioner, you know, my big concern, as I've now looked at, been chair for for seven years, and um, <clears throat> have seen um, a number of these instances uh, uh, that, that you referenced in your testimony, um, uh, that some trends that I've noticed um, are that, particularly when it comes to shelter providers, um, we as a city have, um, have granted significant contracts to providers that don't have uh, track records. <clears throat> Of, um, of delivering high quality services, um, largely because um, uh, it's not that there aren't good providers out there. It's that good providers, um, at least you'll hear this, I'm sure, from um, Home Services United in their testimony, opt not to apply for a lot of contracts because uh, they are concerned that they are not going to be able to provide um, excellent services under the budgets that are provided for in the contracts. And I'll give you an example. Um, I mean, we could look at, at Bronx Parent. Bronx Parent was <clears throat> had their, I mean, if we look at the trajectory of, of their contracts, um, I believe that they, uh, you know, increased their the, the their awards by several hundred percent in a five year time frame. Um, but the more com the more kind of uh, clear case to me is 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 CCS um, that um, you know went from uh, you know I mean when. As you know, there was an article that was, I forget where it was reported, but I first became aware of this agency where there was an article detailing that they had I think it was over 100 or over $200 million worth of contracts, DHS contracts providing family shelter in hotels. And their offices were like, you know, on some second floor in Queens that like didn't have really much of a staff manning it. And so the issues that, that these raise to me is how are we vetting? And this is, a, this is, this is, this is three agencies here. This is D, D, DSS, DOI, and MOPS, I think working in a coordinated fashion. But how are we, how, are, how did we look at that situation and say, okay, uh, here's an organization that like, didn't exist three years ago, uh, 
sure, let's award them a couple hundred million dollars worth of city contracts. I, those are red flags for me. And it goes to just this, you, you mentioned, um, I'm sorry, I'm going all over the place here, but you mentioned that there was, um, um, that, that there's new um, systems in place that can allow agencies to, to look back several years in terms of compliance records and, and um, if there are any corrective actions or anything like that. I mean, something like CCS, they don't even go back that long. I mean, you, you know, that'd be a very limited um, review because they're only a couple of years old. And so I, the, my broad question here, and this, I wanna put this to both Deputy Commissioner Park and Commissioner Garnett of how are, how are we looking at this big picture and saying, okay, why would something like this happen? And how is it that the city um, is, you know, what, how are we, how are we preemptively uh, addressing um, uh, agencies that have a limited track record or a spotty track record from getting, um, you know, outsized contracts? Sure, covered a lot of ground there. Sorry. But I, no, that's okay. I think actually you're really hitting to the heart of the turning the tide plan and, and the, um, approach to transforming the shelter system. I think what you saw in, you know, 2012, 13, 14, right, was very, in, into 15, right, very, very rapid increases in the shelter census um, that had to be dealt with immediately and where there was no plan in place for how to tackle that. And basically what that resulted in, and given the, the legal obligation, moral obligation to provide shelter, what that resulted in was lots of very fast decision-making um, and use of buildings that could be brought online very, very quickly with whoever could bring those on very, very quickly. Um, the turning the tide plan says, no, we don't wanna use that that substandard capacity, we want to have a plan, we need to project how much uh, shelter capacity we need, and we need to bring on high quality um, uh, contract, high quality shelters with the appropriate contracting mechanism around them, right? And that gives a predictability and a runway. Um, we have terrific providers who are applying uh, to our open-ended RFP to provide those really high quality shelters on a regular basis, right? Because that is saying we are gonna uh, plan it out. We are gonna design the building. We are gonna have a, a startup period before clients move in. We are gonna move people in gradually over time. Right, and that is that is the kind of environment that the high quality providers we all want to work with um, can can thrive in. And so, getting out of the we have an emergency because otherwise we are going to be in violation of our legal obligation, and into an environment where we are planning shelter capacity, I think is incredibly important to the issues that you raise. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is that also as part of turning the tide plan, right, we've invested more than a quarter of a billion dollars a year in shelter operations, right, so that allows organizations to um, to hire the caseworkers, to hire the housing specialists um, in, in the tier two shelters, hire the social workers, right, that we need to be able to provide services to our clients and that those high quality organization not-for-profits need to be able to provide the level of services um, that they care about. Um, and then, and lastly, I would just add, and this is, is very recent, but I think this week's announcement around uh, indirect cost rates is gonna be really important as well for investing in a strong not-for-profit sector. Um, you know, it is not-for-profits need good, good boards, they need, uh, good back office functions, they, all of that work is, is, incre is just as important as the social service delivery to making sure that we have a strong track record. Commissioner Garnett, I, I wanna ask, is there something, is you're reviewing the CCS um, um, uh, case file or you know what, what happened there, um, what is your takeaway from what happened there? So I, I think 
first I'll step back and address um, something from your original question, which is that DOI has almost no role in the decision making about awards to particular vendors for, for any city agency. Um, we have an extremely limited role in the city's contracting process in advance, which is simply to um, for contracts over a certain amount, which is now $250,000. Um, DOI has a unit that checks to make sure that DOI doesn't have any substantiated findings in the past against that particular vendor. And if we do, we provide that closing memorandum or other referral letter to the contracting agency to factor into their decision about responsibility. So DOI is not involved in vetting award recipients or vendors or anything like that, other than that in that very limited way. Mm -hmm. um, on CCS, um, as I think you probably know, we have an ongoing criminal investigation into CCS. It was publicly reported that we executed uh, federal search warrants at their offices and facilities last year. Um, everything seems like last year, I'm sorry. I think that was probably in, in late 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think what CCS is, I, I have to be careful what I say about it sure. because it's on okay. matter, but I do yep. think that it is, um, an example of something that DOI has seen numerous times in our nonprofit investigations and that you identified in your question of, at a minimum, an organization that grows too quickly for its capacity um, and, and too quickly for arguably for the agency to provide proper oversight of the contracts. So I think that the, the question of uh, agency's administrative capacity, financial capacity, professionalization of their board um, relative to the size of the contracts we, they have is an issue not just with shelter providers, but Absolutely. an issue across the nonprofit contracting sector, which I think DOI has time and again made recommendations to the various agencies, not just DHS, but DIFTA, DYCD, et cetera, um, about a need to um, take that more seriously in terms of the oversight of their vendors. And I think... Um... I mean, what I would suggest is I, I think, and if you mentioned in your testimony that over the last decade, um, DOI has engaged in a process to kind of try to, to build that up. I think, I think the ongoing relationship um, between DOI, and especially MOX, I mean, I think MOX is in a very important agency in this conversation um, to, to have strong, stronger and clearer standards around governance. Governance, governance, a broad program of governance, I think is, is really essential. And I'm wondering, I mean, I guess my question here now is, does that, does a strong, do we feel like right now we have a strong across the board um, program of governance for agencies that are getting large contracts, whether it could be over two hundred fifty thousand dollars or it could be over ten million dollars, but that we're that we're examining best practices in governance. So that's board development, that's uh, standards and procedures around um, uh, uh, accounting, and um, uh, the things that we're talking about right here about about re, uh, reporting of misconduct and, and, and ability to have independent verification and investigation. Um, how, how is, can you maybe explain a little bit broadly about the relationship between DOI and MOX in developing governance protocols for, for larger uh, contracted agencies? I think you're on mute, Commissioner. There you are. There we go. Sorry, the, the, the host controls it, so um, I can't unmute myself. Um, so I, th I know that we have had and continue to have uh, conversations with Mox about um, what to ask for in Passport, about the guidance to give to individual agencies, contracting officers, about what they should be looking for when making responsibility determinations for vendors. I think some of the issues that you highlighted in terms of um, professionalization of the board, uh, anti-nepotism policies, uh, not having family members or close associates or 
the people involved in subcontractor relationships on, on the board. Um, leadership salaries is another issue that we have um, made a number of recommendations over the years to both MOX and individual agencies about developing a more robust standards around reporting on this executive salaries of nonprofits. So we are, have had ongoing conversations with MOX and the agencies. I think um, it sometimes is complicated for DOI because we are not policy makers and we are need to stand in a place of critiquing implementation of policies. And so we try to strike a balance between using our investigations to make good recommendations to the agencies, but not ourselves becoming involved in making those policies, which really should be made by the agencies themselves, including MOX. So there is an ongoing conversation and we're actively, have been actively engaged in recommendations on many of these matters, um, but, but we are not ourselves sitting at the table to craft the policy. Okay, but I, I, I mean, I guess, <clears throat> so if, I mean, nepotism and executive salary issues are ubiquitous. They are ubiquitous. I mean, we, we were talking about scores of, eight, of not-for-profit agencies without any clear standards. And, um, and I mean, how, how often are we hearing about cases of nepotism? We hear about it all the time, but we only hear about it when it gets to you when it's a problem. And so I, I, but I, how are we, I mean, who's in charge of flagging when a case of nepotism comes to our attention? Maybe it doesn't come from a, um, uh, um, from a, um, client. Maybe it comes from uh, somebody at an agency reviewing a contract, noticing that uh, that somebody has the same, you know, last name as the executive director or board member or something like that. And so, you know, who's is? I mean, is there a? Are we? Are we? Are there? Are there red flags that go up when we're seeing when we're seeing instances of of nepotism, or is there a a, a, a way? for those issues to get flagged. And this could be for either Commissioner Park or Commissioner Garnett, or, you know, for, I mean, for executive salary, I mean, these things are so wildly divergent, but you can have an organization, um, I forget what the salary was at Bronx Parent, but it was really high. And for an organization whose budget was, was in the grand scheme of things, not that high. I mean, you know, that's, there's, there's, um, and so where, who's in charge of enforcing those standards before it becomes a problem? So I'm happy to jump in here. And there's actually, a, I'd like to actually, before, before I answer that question, I'd like to, to go back to the CCS issue, uh, situation, for example, for a minute. I think CCS is a, in many ways, perfect example of getting at some of the larger concerns that you raised initially around how we reinforce standards in the sector. Um, CCS was, if not the largest families with children providers, certainly one of the largest families with children providers, and they are no longer providing any shelter services for DHS whatsoever. They are com we are completely done with work with CCS. So financial closeouts that we have to do, but they are no longer a shelter provider and they are not going to be a shelter provider. So I think we have very, clearly illustrated that no one is too big to fail, that we take these situations very, very seriously, um, and that there will be consequences. So first of all, I, you know, I think CCS, you know, it's a terrible situation, but I also think it is a good example of, of sending exactly the right message that we need to send. So that but it was a terrible situation that was totally foreseeable. I mean, like, as clear as day, this was, it was obvious that like an organization who basically is running out of a PO box, you know, getting a $200 million contract is gonna have some problems. <laughs> I think it was pretty obvious. So let me pivot to your, to your other questions. I think in the regular course of business, MOX requires a number of self-disclosures as part of the contracting process. So, so those exist. Um, they are self-disclosures, but the DHS questionnaire that we have put together with D 
DOI, right, asks for quite a lot of detail on, on nepotism policies, on conflict of interest, on, on a range of different things um, that, and we will be collecting all of that information, reviewing it with an outside entity, working in collaboration with DOI. So I think there is right now this very aggressive proactive effort to look comprehensively across the sector. We aren't distinguishing between entities that are on caps or entities that aren't on caps. It is across the board. Um, and I also, I just would say that, you know, DHS has, has, over the recent years, had a very strong relationship with DOI, and I think that has been helpful because it does mean, you know, when we do have a question, um, there is, when there is a concern that comes up, right, there is a, a pathway where we can, can collaborate and, and sometimes is needed, it results in, in serious investigations, as we've seen. Um, two more things, and I do want to turn to our, our, our colleagues. Um, one is, Commissioner Park, I just want to thank you for mentioning in your testimony um, that frontline staff often, you know, get, get left um, holding the bag on this. And if for an organization, people that work at an organization that ends up getting closed down, you know, they, they didn't do anything wrong necessarily. And here they are having to find a new job. Um, it is so, so, you know, I just want to, I just want to let, I, which I appreciate you mentioning that there are a lot of people out there that are working, that are in this business, that are doing this work for the right reasons and are working hard day in and day out trying to find their clients, sign them up for benefits, taking care of their uh, education needs, taking care of their social services needs, trying to find them a new apartment in really um, adverse uh, environments. And, um, and, 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 and so, um, you know, we want to make sure that they were honoring their work uh, while also ensuring uh, accountability from from the higher ups in the agencies. That's number one. Number two, I, I, I strongly encourage you both to stay and listen to the testimony of Catherine Trapani, who's the executive director of Homeless Services United, which is the organization that's like an umbrella organization for homeless services providers that are you know, that, that are more of the longstanding providers that have these strong internal accountability measures um, that have, uh, you know, that, 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 are, that are really invested in this work for the long term. And I do encourage you both to, to stay and listen to them. And, and if you're not able to, to get a copy of their testimony and read it over later, because, um, you know, what I've heard from Catherine is that, um, is that, Reputable and and um, and long term providers are very reluctant to take on new contracts, um, and uh, you know do do so with a lot of trepidation because of budgetary issues. And so this isn't necessarily this is we should you know maybe OMB should be part of this conversation as well because OMB signs off on on what is allowed to go into these contracts. And they're frankly, you know, nickel and diming it, and it's not acceptable. And um, uh, and it's just uh, if we can't, if we're hearing from the input, and I appreciate again the the indirect rate issue, but if we're hearing from providers, look, we're not bidding on these contracts because they don't pay enough to provide decent level of service. We need to pay attention to that and take it seriously, not just. Uh, brush it off and think of it as like them just trying to get more money, but really take it seriously because these are organizations that are running huge deficits trying to provide good services and, um, you know, are often doing private fundraising to supplement <clears throat> their city contract, be able to do the level of service that's necessary. And OMB needs to hear that, that if <clears throat> that you get what you pay for. OMB needs to hear that. You get what you pay for. And if you're going to, if you're going to be cheap on your contract, you're going to get less than stellar providers that are that are bidding on the 200 million dollar contracts so just 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 i just i need i i really really need that message to go back to omb that listen you get what you pay for you want good services you gotta compensate the not-for-profits accordingly okay um absolutely i agree with you on the the frontline staff i think it's really important that you recognize it we um the 
day-to-day -day work that so many people do is so important and terrific, and thank you for acknowledging that. Um, with uh, Catherine and I, I have a very collegial relationship with Catherine. We, we work very closely together, and I really appreciate all of her advocacy for the sector um, and the problem solving that she and I have done together. Um, you know, certainly hear and understand the, the financial constraints um, faced by not-for-profit organizations. We work very closely both with uh, Homeless Services United and with individual not-for-profits. Um, I would just point out we have at this point four or five dozen proposals in the queue that we are in the process of, of reviewing and scoring. So I, I absolutely believe the not-for-profits want to make sure that we are funding people appropriately, but also really appreciate the fact that there is still um, strong interest in providing high quality programming from, from those providers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Levin. Uh, now I'll turn it over to our committee council to recognize our colleagues who have questions for the administration. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Gibson and Chair Levin. I'll now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. We will be limiting council member questions and answers to five minutes. The Sergeant Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. And we will be begin with council member Rosenthal followed by council member Diaz. Over to council member Rosenthal. Time starts now. Oh, great, I've been unmuted. Thank you so much. Um, well, boy, uh, everyone, I mean, to the panel and to the chairs, this has been a, a really powerful hearing. Um, I appreciate everyone's um, really thoughtful work here um, in response to what, what is a just terrific story. Um, I'd like to just uh, if it's all right with you, uh, drill down a little bit more about my two bills um, and hear um, from you uh, about what you think about um, sort of codifying and, uh, you know, routinizing how uh, anyone who, who hears about a survivor, who hears from a survivor how they respond and ensuring that the first response is in the interests of the survivor themselves. Sure, uh, thank you. And I wanna start by really thanking you for the incredibly valuable suggestion that you had our preliminary budget hearing um, that we develop a, a, essentially a user guide to, for, for survivors that has been created and distributed. Um, oh, wow. it, was, it was really thoughtful, so thank you. Um, I think we really support the intent of the bill, and I think we'd like to, to work with you on some of the details. Um, and maybe that's something that we can do offline. I'd also um, welcome my, my colleague, Erin Drinkwater, who's on. She may have some additional thoughts. Um, with respect to the, the broader bill, um, I think that's a place where I think I need to really defer to my colleagues at Mox, who unfortunately aren't here today, but it does have ramifications that go beyond uh, DSS, so so I'm going to defer there. Yeah, on the the um, contract yeah, um, conflict of interests. Yeah, no, I'm really. Um, I think there are issues. We're going to hear a lot of issues with that bill, and I always worry about um, what we layer on top for nonprofits. But you know, Councilmember Levin mentioned something uh, very straightforward. You know, does when when somebody walks into a shelter, any shelter. Is there, you know, a framed, um, you know, sheet of paper? I know there's lots of information that's put up there, but, you know, how I, I, do you have on your checklist uh, when you inspect all shelters whether or not they make it very clear that of uh, how what people can do should they experience this by somebody else in the shelter or a provider? worker, anything. So it is absolutely, we have distributed that information. We expect uh, providers to post it um, as, because the shelters are also physically different. I, I don't want to speak 
um, to exactly where everything is posted. But as I mentioned, I'd be more than happy to get you copies of the materials that everybody is expected to have posted. Yeah. And then, you know, just sort of is it on your checklist when you go do an inspection as to whether or not it exists somewhere? Um, I, it is something that we look for, whether it is physically on the, on the checklist, I am not sure. So we will get back to you on that. Yeah, because I think it'd be interesting to know how many times and what happened when an inspector saw it wasn't there. Sure. Right. So, um, I mean, I don't want to, you know, I know it's too much tracking, but um, I think we have to pull out all the stops here. And understood. I, and I absolutely agree with the sentiment and it is something that we take very seriously. As I say, it's something we've been actively mirroring with the providers. I just don't want to give information that, that, that might not be correct. And I don't know right. whether it's physically. Would you mind just for the public? I mean, this is um, a serious question. What are the hurdles here? Like one hurdle I can imagine is training the 311 operators to know what to do when they get those calls. That's a serious hurdle. And what language do we give them and what language, um, right? What, what does it look like on the drop down menu? Um, do we connect them immediately? You know, those are things that we've talked about before with NGBV. Um, what's another hurdle to getting this right for survivors? Oh, I'm sorry, Chair, may I continue for another few minutes? Uh, Chair still... Gibson? Okay, thank you. Um, so I think that we operate a system, a fairly diffuse system, and that I think is both really a, a blessing and a curse here, right? There are a lot of different pathways that people can use to report um, sexual harassment or sexual assault. That's a good thing because what is comfortable for me may not be comfortable for you. There are different sets of circumstances. People should have a lot of different pathways that they can, can communicate. But it also means that you have a lot of different people and a lot of different players who need to be fully trained and trauma informed. Oh, you froze at a really important, and I agree with everything you're saying. <laughs> um, uh, Deputy Commissioner Drinkwater, do you wanna pick it up from there? Yes, I will. I'm just gonna okay. actually also shoot Molly a note to let, to just see that everything's sure, right. Sure, sure. Care. Who oh, there you are, you're uh, back. Very focused on me, take great. Maybe I'm just going to take myself off video for a minute. Maybe it yeah. will help. But thank you. Um, because we have this this diffuse system, which I think offers some advantages, right? I'm not I'm sorry. I may be repeating myself. I'm not sure where I cut out. But um, you know, the pathway of reporting that is comfortable for one person might not be the the comfortable pathway for another person. Um, that that diffuse system offers some advantages, but it also means you have a lot of people who need to be trained in trauma-informed care, who need to understand all the language access rules, who need to, um, have all the resources available to them. We absolutely invest in that training and we invest in training that is very broad-based, but I, you know, you asked about hurdles and I'm being, being honest here yeah. about, you know, what I think is, is a hurdle. Um, you know, a, a, possible silver lining of the very challenging experiences that we've had over the last year with the pandemic is that um, we've really developed some really excellent new um, online trainings that, you know, while uh, that, that make it easier to reach that diffuse audience. So, um, you know, we are doing language access training, we are doing uh, trauma-informed care training, and we can do all of that online at this point, and that allows us to reach a lot of people. I think it will be very positive going forward. Yeah, I, I really think that, you know, um, if we don't grab this moment, it's going to be lost to us for another 20 years. So now's the time to grab it and um, 
you know, I'm hearing the hurdles and I'm hearing, you know, that we can work on them and get over them. You know, maybe it's something different than exactly what the bill asks. There, are, you're right. There are lots of different ways to respond. And yes, uh, it's best for survivors to get a trauma-informed response. But in many ways, it's very simple to say the first response is to look out for the interests of the individual, right? The first response is, I believe you, what do you need? Understood. Um, and then, and then, you know, um, I, I, I'm confident that everyone would say, I need somebody to advocate for me. I need, I need to get my head straight. I need to get my head in the game. And then you connect them with all those advocates who are out there. Um, at which point you have a trauma-informed individual who can help them think through what they want to do and how they recover themselves. So I think we just have to keep coming back to that very simple um, first response and not overcomplicate it. I think what you describe is very much in line with Administrator Carter's vision for the agency. What she says to all of us all the time is we are raising the bar on service delivery at DHS, right? And that is about infusing everything that the agency does with a trauma-informed lens, with making sure that we are providing good training um, that, and thinking really critically and thoughtfully about the services that, that we DHS and our providers are, are offering. Um, and that is, applies to issues of reporting sexual harassment, sexual assault, but it's much broader than that. And when we have an agency on a provider base that, that speaks that trauma-informed language that has really raised the bar on service delivery, it is gonna positively impact what you're talking about. That's right. We just need to get the survivor to that person. Um, you know, uh, Commissioner Gardner, I, can I ask you from your experience doing investigations? Um, and I'm asking, you know, I'm certainly not asking you to reveal anything about anyone. But in your experience in trying to investigate in whatever agency, but these types of, of um, concerns, have you noticed that, is there anything that you, you can think of that could have preempted the thing from occurring, the assault from happening? I mean, I know it's human behavior, bad human behavior. Um, but, and, and have you found anything in terms of the city's response to these situations where perhaps it's worked better at one agency versus another agency? So I, I, I think that um, some of the same issues that we have flagged in our you know, financial investigations of nonprofit providers contributes to situations where um, other kinds of problems, whether they're um, sexual harassment or sexual assault or other kinds of mistreatment of, of client recipients, some of the same dynamics are at play in, in both kinds of impropriety, which is that um, the, the, the growth in an organization from a, um, a small one that is centered around a single person's vision that often is started with that person inviting their family members and friends from other things to join them in this endeavor. Yes. And then the difficulty um, that we see time and again, so sometimes well-intentioned difficulty and sometimes um, less well-intentioned difficulty of moving from a, a single person's passion project to an actual professional organization that has the structure, systems, policies, practices that are appropriate to the level of service and level of contracts that they're now in the business of providing. And so I think you asked, do different agencies um, handle it differently? I, I think there are differences across uh, social service agencies in terms of how they approach this problem of assisting their providers to professionalize. Um, but it's, mm. a, 
it's a vital role. I think the city has chosen to outsource a huge range of human service, social service um, programs to outside providers. And if the city, if that's a policy the city wants to continue to pursue, then what goes with that is some responsibility to for sure help organizations have the policies, programs, oversight that is a good match for the level of services they're providing and the amount of money that's coming in. And I think some of those same dynamics and the difficulty of moving from, you know, one person sort of fiefdom, uh, their pet project to a real professional organization is where you, that, that causes a lot of the range of problems, whether the issues that you're concerned about in terms of sexual harassment, sexual assault, and not enough structure around addressing that, or whether it's financial improprieties, I think some of the same dynamics are at play. Is that something that could be red flaggable? Yeah, and actually DOI has done um, a lot of training over the years of ACOs, of the audit staff at various city agencies to give them guidance about red flags to look for in terms of whether it's nepotism, whether it's, do they have, is there appropriate board review yeah. of executive salaries or budget and things of that nature? What are the kinds of policies that a professional organization of this size should have? Um, and we have been actively engaged in that training. Do you think it's red flaggable on mocks at, in the, con you know, In other words, it, um, as I've done this work with bad contractors in talking to um, HPD, I don't, I still don't quite understand it and perhaps I'm saying it wrong, but there's some federal law that you can't debar a, con a, a building contractor, but that's actually what should happen. Um, because they've been repeatedly, you know, wage theft, abuse of workers, sexual abuse, whatever it is. And all the HPD can do is put it on a list of bad actors um, and never take them off. But that doesn't seem to change the city's willingness to contract with that provider. Yeah, so but the... I'm not suggesting that we never contract with these providers, the social service providers, but you know, one of the things that I thought was interesting when I was asking about it was that in the contract review process, you literally could not have a red flag in the system that would note that this person is on the bad actor list. Yeah, the, as I understand it, the way the city's contracting system works is that it, much of the burden is on agency ACOs to make a responsibility determination and MOX does mm. provide guidance mm. to those ACOs about, hey, here are the things you should be looking at. And we at, at DOI um, have regularly made recommendations to MOX about things that we think they should be providing additional training or Great. guidance on to agency ACOs. But ultimately, because of the huge range and complexities of the city's contracting, um, much of that discretion and decision-making about who is responsible and what does responsibility mean is left up to individual agency ACOs to make that judgment. Great, okay, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Thank you for giving me the extra time. I just wanna get confirmation from DHS that you'd be willing to set up a little working group to um, push this idea along for, for how we can better respond for survivors. We'd be happy to work with you, of course. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Chair, for your indulgence. All right, so at this time, I don't see any other council members with their hands raised. If there is any other council member who wishes to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function now. And if not, I will turn it back over to Chair Gibson. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, just a few more questions. I wanted to circle back. Uh, I, had to, I too had to take my video off as well. 
Um, I wanted to ask about some of the cases where providers are on the corrective action plan. Um, in one instance with children's community services, uh, when they were put on the corrective action plan, we actually asked for um, a judge to place them under receivership. So I wanted to understand some of the thresholds and guidelines that DSS uses with providers on the corrective action plan. At what point or what types of infractions would warrant uh, a receivership or filing these particular plans with judges? Sure, and I'm gonna try again with the video. If it doesn't work, please let me know. Okay. Uh, the, uh, so the, the court receiver and court appointed receiver and filing the corrective action plan with is really the exception, not the rule. Um, as I as I mentioned, we we use the cap process to to uh, try to right the ship. Right, it is about investing in the organization, um, and and given the array of, of circumstances that where we do use a cap, right, uh, a newer organization that needs to build capacity from the beginning. Um, in some instances, it is you know an organization made what is really an honest mistake, but we need to make sure that they are learning from that and, and um, course correcting. Um, sometimes it's some external audit functions uh, or findings that may or may not fully reflect what, what we think about the quality of the work, but um, to be responsive to the audit, we use a cap process. And in other instances, it's there are more serious concerns, right? So a cap is a tool that we employ in a lot of different situations. Um, the goal always is to is to get the organization back into a place where they can provide or to a place where they can provide high quality services. Um, we want continuity of service for our clients. And we also really wanna build off in many cases, we're talking about organizations that have strong connections to the community that we also value. Um, as Chair Levin pointed out, we also wanna respect the work of the frontline staff. So writing this ship is the, is the goal. If it can't happen, we will, um, sometimes it means intensifying the cap. So going from changing uh, internal protocols to requiring hiring an outside monitor um, and then Court action is is really unusual. To the best of my knowledge, CCS is the only time we've ever filed a cap with the courts. Okay, um, and in many of the cases where you do have corrective action plans, um, do you typically re uh, restore those contracts, uh, or is, is there a trend where some are suspended and or terminated? Like, what are some of the, the patterns that you have with many of these providers? Sure. So, so let me use our current cap list as an example, mm -hmm. I think it would be helpful um, without going in, into detail about specific organizations. We right. currently have 11 cap, 11 organizations on caps. Um, two of those are organizations that we have fully phased out, Bedco and CCS. Um, the caps remain, however, because there's some financial closeouts that we have going on. Um, a third organization is, is fairly close to that phase out period as well. So that's three of the 11. Uh, a fourth one is, is Bronx Parent, where as I, I talked about, we're certainly not doing any new work with them right now. Um, they, are, they are still an active service provider with the contracts that they had in place. Um, if we can course correct with the, with the interim CEO and with the changes that are happening, that um, we are, that is our focus right now. Um, a couple of the 11 are brand new organizations or brand new to DHS organizations. We have used the cap structure to help them grow. Um, another couple have had, you know, what I talked about is sort of um, infractions that were well-intentioned, but mis, mis, uh, misapplication of policy. Um, you know, I think it is really important. I said this in my testimony, right? But not every not every mistake is evidence of fraud. Um, it is procurement rules are complicated. Uh, uh, compliance with with um, invoicing procedures are complicated. It is possible to be um, very well intentioned and still make a mistake, and we use the cap as a tool to correct that. And then we have a handful that are left where the concerns are a bit more serious, and whether or not we go the route of phasing out or we are able to course correct, I think is is still an open question. Okay, and now moving forward, uh, 
how do you believe the city has made efforts to improve the system, to streamline the system, to increase efficiency? And even with the executive order in place, you know, there's always room for improvement. Um, I think today's hearing highlighted some of the things that I generally am concerned with that exist. And I'm wondering how the city council can work with DSS on closing any of these gaps in, in service making sure that clients are assured that there is a process in which they can come forth, their identity is concealed, uh, their safety is protected, and how can we move beyond, you know, this particular instance with, you know, BPHN, but really set a standard of exceptional service moving forward and hold everyone accountable. I think this instance has really put everyone on notice and I give credit for all of the great homeless service providers, many of whom I know uh, that do great work. And I know anytime something happens with, you know, a, a neighbor or someone in your network, you know, we all feel that. We all feel that, that concern and, you know, that embarrassment of how this happened. But I want to make sure the city council continues to work with DSS um, in this budget season as we continue to move forward. We spend a lot of money, Deputy Commissioner, as you know, on homeless services. We have a, an obligation to provide homeless services to every New Yorker that comes into our shelter system. And I just wanna make sure that we send a message that this is not um, a, a, a character assassination on everyone, but this is an instance in where someone was accused uh, of doing you know, wrong and they're going to be held to a certain system. But at the end of the day, it does not outweigh all the great work that homeless services providers do give every single day across our city. Absolutely. Um, I really echo that, that sentiment. Um, you know, what we have here is a balancing act. We have a system that grew up over decades and we are working hard to, to reform that, to increase transparency, to increase accountability, um, to support providers. The vast majority of providers uh, we know do work incredibly hard to provide really good work, um, but we also know that there have been incidents, right? The, the questionnaire, the survey that I talked about in testimony, um, which really does take a very uh, broad brush view looking at all of the providers, I think will be something that will help us build for a very long term um, and improve the quality of the of the sector as a whole, because we will have that, uh, that in all the information that we are talking about really dig into the accountability um, and you know may potentially help us hone in on some problems or not right but that we are putting in the effort now to build that strong foundation for something that is going to stand uh, DHS providers and really the sector as a whole in good stead for many years going forward. Um, and we certainly welcome the opportunity to work in partnership with the with the council um, either talking further about these bills or in other contexts to, to make sure that we are continuing to support providers. Okay, great. I appreciate that. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Um, I have two questions, Commissioner Garnett, for you, just with respect to your testimony around one of the proposed bills, intro 2292, uh, that would provide um, reporting of allegations of misconduct made under section 12-113 and the development of web applications to track city agency and contractor compliance with certain investigations and recommendations. So number one, I think you've made it clear uh, that you intend to work with us to address the concerns that you've outlined while we work collectively to achieve transparency and accountability and the goals of the legislation, correct? Yes. Okay, great, great, great. Um, wanted to ask you how many misconduct investigations does DOI conduct in a given year? And what are some of the most common types of complaints that you typically investigate as it relates to misconduct? So DOI gets thousands of complaints each year. Um, and if anyone, any members of the public or the council who are interested, we, we report in aggregate numbers in the Marist Management Report publicly. So we get thousands of complaints each year that come in from city employees, from employees of vendors, from members of the general public, from um, as official referrals from other city agencies. And out of those thousands of complaints, um, we open hundreds of investigations each year. At any given time, DOI typically has 
um, between 1,200 and 2,000 open investigations. And those investigations uh, run the gamut from, we're also the statutory investigator for the Conflicts of Interest Board. So um, our investigations sort of run the gamut from kind of time and attendance abuse by a single employee up to um, you know, massive fraud cases involving hundreds of millions of dollars um, potentially. So um, things really, I mean, I would say what's the most common? Uh, the most common are um, in number are probably relatively low level time and attendance abuse, uh, violations of the city's conflicts of interest rules relating to using city resources or your city position for personal benefit, um, as well as relatively low level embezzlement or bribery by city employees. So uh, receipt, receiving bribes um, or relatively low level um, embezzlement. So in terms of volume, I would say that kind of category um, takes up a lot of volume. Um, but then of course we also have um, very significant serious investigations into corruption by elected officials or senior um, agency officials um, corruption or other misconduct, as well as fraud by vendors and contractors that can be, you know, run into the tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay. And is it common for employees to face retaliation for filing a misconduct complaint? And if so, uh, what steps has DOI taken to provide any safeguards and protections for employees that do come forth with a complaint? So I, I would say it's really a tremendous testament, I think, both to DOI's well-established role and our protections for confidentiality. And I think the, the general level of understanding in the city about uh, DOI that we actually get very few, compared to the volume of complaints we get, we have really very few complaints of city employees who say that they believe they've been retaliated against for making a complaint. Regardless of the number, we take those complaints extremely seriously um, because any retaliation against a city employee really strikes at the heart of what DOI's mission is and kind of our unique role in New York City where employees are required by law to report corruption to DOI. So we want to do, you know, we know that city employees are kind of our best defense, our, our, our best um, window into corruption. And so we want to do everything we can. So we promise uh, complainants confidentiality for as long as we can maintain that. Um, at, at some point, particularly if there's a criminal case, um, once you're a witness in a criminal case, if you have to testify at a trial, you know that has to be public. That's the Constitution. So there are limits to forever confidentiality, but our goal is to provide confidentiality, an open place for the filing of complaints. Um, for any city employee for as long as we possibly can. Okay. And in your opinion, um, as we look at the executive order and we have made substantial changes to the way homeless service providers uh, account for any cases from clients of alleged abuse or misconduct, um, just as I asked the first deputy commissioner, um, how do you see the city council working with you with DOI so that we can strengthen protections for clients in our homeless shelters and make sure that we hold all of our provider, providers to a higher level of standards so that we don't have another unfortunate case like we have seen um, and, and certainly you know, making sure that everyone understands that there are rules to be followed and we want everyone to be treated with dignity and respect and also given a safe space to come forward with any allegations of misconduct uh, as they see fit. Uh, yeah, so I, I think a lot of the points have already been made and, and just very briefly, I think one key thing is making sure that um, complaints and victims know about and get to the place that is the place that is most able to help them. Um, and as, uh, as First Deputy Commissioner Park said, that will be different for different victims. But there are a lot of agencies and places in New York City that have really well-trained, competent staff and ensuring that victims know where to go and that appropriate services are available to them at the right place to bring their complaint is I think crucially important. And that's really a public education campaign um, in part. And then on the city side, I think, you know, 
uh, the council with these bills and with the EO as well is following, I think, a time-honored and often successful path to use the city's massive contracting power um, to, to uh, put forward the city's values. And I think if the city through the council or the mayor or wherever it's coming from wants to say sexual harassment by the city's not going to contract with, eight, with entities that don't have proper policies, procedures, and controls to create a safe workplace and a safe service provision place, um, then I think that's appropriate for the city to be using its contracting authority um, to put out those values and to enforce them. Great, thank you. Well, I appreciate you saying that and I appreciate you know DSS. And again, I do think we're talking about vulnerable New Yorkers that need so much support and they are in a state of temporary housing, trying to find real affordable housing in our city trying to create stability for themselves and their families. And so we have to do everything possible, even beyond today's hearing, beyond the executive order, to make sure that everyone is held to a higher standard. We will not accept this type of behavior from anyone at an executive level or an administrative level or any other level at a provider agency. Um, and I say that because I know many, many families that live in temporary housing every single day. And what they have endured the past year with COVID-19 has exacerbated their current circumstance, struggling for basic necessities like food, roof over their head, digital divide, connectivity issues so their children can learn remotely. I mean, it's been a lot. Um, and, and so I wanna make sure that we're doing our part to assure them out there, all of our advocates that do this work every day, that we are working together towards common goals and common priorities. I emphasize that so much. Um, and I thank you for being here. That's all for my questions. I wanna recognize my colleague who has questions and then we'll, we will close out with our chair, Steve Levin. So let me recognize now for questions, council member Dharma Diaz. Thank you, colleague. Thank you all for this opportunity. My colleagues, thank you for taking the charge on what many of us have been mortified by. Um, December 2nd was the last, the last December 1st was the last day of service for me working within the shelter system and definitely dismayed. I, I wanna um, put a hammer to the, con I wanna amplify that nepotism is real within providers, which leads to discourse amongst coworkers. I, and I'll be particular about, about a, I won't say the name to the provider because now they're no longer a provider, which in DSS, DHS rather, there was a family member, an executive hired a family member into one of their shelters. He had uh, an affair with, it turned out to be a relationship and they were both moved into my shelter. He was always intoxicated, had issues. I reported it to the administration. It got to the point with him that he went one day to assault me. I'm four foot nine and a quarter. This man was a little over six foot two. When I reached out to my board administrator, I was told, handle it. It's the population that we're working with. I share to say that DHS needs to do better by the staffers. And when we call in a situation, it's real. I'm glad that that staffer over DHS is no longer there. I also want to go to the, I want to know in reference to NYPD being taken out of the shelters. What are we doing to enhance the services that are being provided by the safety officers? More so, meaning, are we giving the sites, the providers, additional funds to pay for safety officers? Sure. Um, so, just to to clarify, uh, DHS or sorry, NYPD is no longer overseeing the DHS peace officers. So we right. still have a, a robust, um, so that, it, and we are in the process of replacing that uh, management structure at, with DHS employees. We have a really terrific uh, new deputy commissioner who has a deep background in both security, but also human services, which I think is, is a really valuable combination. Um, 
the DHS peace officers are still um, part of the shelter system, an important part of the shelter system. We have done some restructuring recently. So that we are um, focusing the DHS peace officers at intake and at assessment sites, um, also on Wards Island, where we have a particular concentration of shelters. Um, and then, so, so um, there are same number of peace officers at a fewer number of sites. Um, it makes it easier um, and I think more effective to provide supervision and support to those peace officers. The shelters that used to have peace officers that no longer do have a full complement of private contracted security. And in addition, we are also working with those providers to add money funding to their budget for additional social service staff. Um, those amendments are in process. You say process, can you please share me what the timeline is? Um, I would say it'll probably be a couple of additional months before, before those amendments are processed. That's disheartening. I have a site, maybe five minutes from my office if I chose to work there, that has, I would say on any given day, we have 50, if not more individuals that are, that are loitering around the site. It's obvious to me that the, the Canva site does not have control and they're in need of additional staff today, not in 90 days. We need to help providers help themselves. So I would be more than happy to talk about the, the specific uh, situation. And, and certainly if people are behaving in a, in a way that is in a way problematic for the community, that's something that we should dig in. I would also uh, raise the point though that um, particularly in this environment where, where we can't have indoor socialization um, and, and people can't spend time with, with their friends and neighbors indoors. All of us, and including people experiencing homelessness, are spending more time in outdoor public spaces. Um, it's so I under, um, again, to the extent that there are things that are that are um, concerning for the community that are going on, I'm more than happy to, to dig in with that in that specific shelter. Yeah, I, I am an advocate for homeless individuals. I've been homeless, so I understand it. I don't have an issue with the fact that they're outside I, I, walking to the community. My, my issue is when it comes to check-in, when it comes to just assuring that they themselves, that, that, the, that they're being provided services as needed and not being pushed out of the shelter because the staff in the shelter is not able to deal with them because their manpower is not sufficient. Uh, That's one. Of course. of course, and I apologize okay. for going back off video. I got another one of the unstable internet connection messages. Um, you know, absolutely, again, happy to dig into the specifics, the shelter offline. Um, all of our shelter providers uh, have a full complement of, of case managers, of security, most of them at this point, private contracted security. Um, of and then the services that exist um, otherwise can vary by by shelter, but recreation staff, medical staff, uh, job specialists, housing specialists. Every every shelter has housing specialists. Um, so there are an array of services. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but not every shelter has housing specialists. It's, there may be uh, a budget line for it, but just know that's not so. Certainly, if people have vacant, it is possible that people have vacancies. Okay, because again, I was there for 13 years and I was a one-stop shop at my facility. But my next question, um, thank you for your time and, and for, your, for answering my questions to the best of your abilities. I have a fiscal conduit question. Mike, I, I like to know how do you monitor when um, agency B um, is receiving the funds and they're receiving the funds in a timely fashion. Um, sure. my, my, understand, my, my understanding is that I, Dharma Diaz, can be a fiscal, uh, a ABC shelter provider, can be a, a, a fiscal conduit for CDE. So sure, the CDE is able to provide services, but the funds come through my said, organ my said organization and then I move forward and, and give the organization that's indeed providing the services, the, the, the financial 
resources, the funds. A, a, a subcontracting relationship? Yes, yes, that's it, yes. Okay. Um, so I think our, the first responsibility at, at DHS is to make sure that um, contracts are registered in a timely way, that invoices are processed promptly, and the payments are made promptly, right? And those, those interactions are occurring with the, with the primary provider, with the organization with which we have the contract. Um, it is then the responsibility of the, uh, of the provider to turn around and pay their subcontractor. Um, if that is not happening, um, you know, DHS will sometimes, first of all, I think it's, it's fairly unusual and particularly unusual because we are, um, when we make payments on contracts, we are essentially paying on a reimbursement basis, right? We are looking for an invoice to say, uh, provider X, you paid your security company, for example. Um, and we are looking at those invoices. So, but yes, you are absolutely correct. There are instances where there are delays in payments to subs. Um, and and in there, in, when there are cases where, where we actually think that that is a sign of a problem with the provider, we certainly do step in and we are uh, engaged in the conversation both with the provider and the sub to work out whatever issue may exist. When, within the, the monitoring tool process, is there a staff person that's assigned to look at that fiscal conversation to assure that the monies have been just not only received, the reimbursement funds received, but that have been dispersed to the big organization? So uh, invoice review and the financial accountability is, in, is a really important part of both uh, analyst, program administrator, and assistant commissioner jobs, right? They are looking at the looking very closely at the payment process um, in general that's that is largely about reviewing the invoices that providers submit to us um, I would also say there's a there's an audit function right where we have uh, the DSS audit team is going out and and reviewing providers um, to, uh, financial records, reviewing their, their payment histories, um, otherwise looking to make sure that they are remaining accountable. That is something that we do on an ongoing basis um, throughout the year. Um, and, and then there's an open line of dialogue so that if there is a subcontractor who is reporting problems, as I say, we are happy to work with them. What do you see to be a, resp a responsible time line from organization A to organization B to disperse the monies. I've heard situations where the monies may come in on the 5th and it's the 28th of the month and they're still waiting for their funds to be delivered to them. I mean, I'd be happy to talk about specific cases offline. I think the contract that the provider has with their sub presumably should specify a payment timeline that's going okay. to be specific to that contract so I can't really opine on that okay thank you thank you for allowing me to ask my questions I'm done no more questions at this time thank you council member Diaz now I'll turn it over to my co-chair chair Levin thank you very much chair Gibson I just have one last follow-up question this is a specific question about with Bronx parent um they made some they did some settlements some um, monetary settlements with um, with uh, people that that brought um, uh, the accusations forward. Do we know whether what, with what monies they paid out those settlements? Because um, I mean, did they did they use city monies at all, or or how did they pay for it? I I don't know. That's absolutely not something though that they would be able to complain claim uh, against their contracts. Okay, but how? I mean. They, they would, if it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, you know, where are they, where are they getting that money? And not-for-profits very often have private fundraising that is outside the scope of, of DHS. Um, you know, I can speak to what is submitted on, on invoices and what we would, what we would pay. Um, absolutely, we would never recognize that. Okay, but so can we find out with what monies they used to pay out settlements? 
Yeah, I think one, you know, one of the issues that the monitor um, will be looking at in evaluating the, um, the, the organization's policies around sexual harassment and other issues and their relationship with their former CEO, Victor Rivera, um, will be able to get you the information on that. That'll be encompassed within the monitor's review. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair Levin. I'll turn it back over to our council, Aminta Kilowan. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Chair Gibson. We are now going to turn to public testimony. Thank you to the members of the administration for testifying today. So once more, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we're going to be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and you will be called on after each panel has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All testimony will be limited to two minutes. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. And again, as a reminder, written testimony can be submitted to testimony at council.nyc.gov. The first panelist for today's hearing will be Catherine Trapani, followed by Tawaki Kamatsu, followed by Wes Rickson. And we will begin with Catherine Trapani. Time starts now. Thank you. My name is Catherine Trapani, and I am the Executive Director of Homeless Services United. HSU is a coalition of approximately 50 nonprofit agencies serving homeless and at risk adults and families in New York City. Each day, HSU member programs work with thousands of homeless families and individuals, preventing shelter entry whenever possible, and working to end homelessness through counseling, social services, health care, legal services, and public benefits access, among other supports. We thank Chairpersons Levin and Gibson and members of the City Council for your commitment to ensuring high quality homeless services are available to all in need and for your continuing leadership on the creation and protection of affordable housing and related services to all New Yorkers. HSU was founded by a committed group of nonprofit leaders to defend the right to shelter and to elevate best practices cultivated by mission-driven service providers. Throughout our history, we have advocated for high quality programs and services for people experiencing homelessness and are proud of the work that all of our member programs do. There is no place in our community for persons who would seek to exploit their positions of power to harm the people we serve or employ. We all have a responsibility to ensure that our organizations are responsibly and professionally managed. It is painful to learn that when extreme misconduct was discovered, the city allowed it to continue with new contract awards being given to those who had demonstrated that they either weren't ready to or could not be trusted to administer homeless services programs. The Department of Homeless Services has stated that they had no choice but to continue to do business with unscrupulous or even dangerous service providers because of the right to shelter. While it's true that the city must open new programs to uphold that right, it is unfortunate that instead of asking why responsible providers couldn't or wouldn't open new programs to help them meet their obligations, they instead turn to untested groups with questionable governance or other deficiencies. Instead of contracting with bad actors, the city could instead address longstanding problems with the way homeless service contracts are structured and administered to ensure responsible providers are able to I'm afford what we need it. Um, Chair, may I continue? Yes. Thank you. I started as executive director of HSU in 2016, and even before my official first day on the job, I was invited to a meeting with Commissioner Banks and members of my board to discuss what had become a crisis of such significant proportions that many shelter providers were on the brink of collapse. Following a reorganization at DSS that moved the contracting function out of DHS and collapsed it into HRA, timely registration of homeless shelter contracts plummeted sector-wide. Providers were working without contracts, unable to bill for services, and were struggling to meet payroll. From the moment I walked into the door and every day since, I've worked with DSS to course correct. It wasn't until fiscal 2019 that things began to normalize. It is no wonder that when the city issued urgent calls for providers to open new shelters to meet skyrocketing demand for shelter six or seven years ago, very few established providers were able to afford to answer their call. Instead, the agency poured hundreds of millions of dollars into relatively unknown agencies, two of which have since collapsed following re revelations of self-dealing and other improprieties. I don't raise this as a gotcha tactic, but as a warning of what may still be to come. 
Following a crush of budget actions, contracts, and amendments in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, HSU's members are once again struggling financially. Providers are owed millions of dollars in delayed contracts and are dipping into line of credit to make payroll and keep their programs operational. While I wanna give DSS credit uh, for working with us to address the delays as Commissioner Park testified, uh, DSS's contracting pipeline must be upgraded to handle greater capacity and process contracts and registrations in a more streamlined manner to prevent this problem from repeating. Our sector is still working to rebound with nonprofits in precarious financial situations. Should the city find itself in need of surge capacity, perhaps when the eviction moratorium is lifted, I worry our providers may not be able to answer the call. Our members and other shelter providers are in the process of cooperating with DHS on a comprehensive review triggered by the latest scandal to ensure that all providers have policies and procedures in place that can help guard against these types of abuses that have been recently reported. While it can be helpful to have a second set of eyes to ensure policies and procedures are in place to guard against nepotism, conflicts of interest, and sexual harassment, the scope of the review is far more in-depth and duplicative of audit and vendor integrity functions that should already be in place. We believe in a high level of transparency, but the administrative burden of this review is not insignificant. While we will work with DSS and our members to cooperate with the investigation, it is difficult not to be struck by the fact that the city should have a functioning contract system that weeded out proposals from these bad actors in the first place, preventing their abuses from ever occurring. It is incumbent upon the city to cure the situation at once and ensure that business practices are set up to promptly register and pay contracts in a timely manner and that funding levels are sufficient and flexible enough to enable providers to respond to emergencies, including adequately compensating our staff, frontline staff, I should say. Further, the city must look at their internal procedures to ensure that there is that if there is a dearth of qualified providers bidding on a contract for required services, that they immediately take steps to address deficiencies in their contract or business practices to ensure that quality providers can perform the necessary service. Um, I have a couple of notes on the proposed legislation that I'll submit in writing because you've already indulged me to speak far over my time and I appreciate that and I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Catherine. I, I, um, I, I appreciate very much the points that you, you raised in your testimony here. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to make sure that we have your written testimony uh, forwarded to, um, to Commissioner Garnett and, um, and to the director of MOX. Um, I think it, it raises, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a point that needs to be raised over and over and over again. Um, and that, um, you know, there is, I, I, I just want to, and just to be clear, your members, um, there is a significant reluctance among your members to bid on new contracts. That's what you told me. That's, that's, yeah, there's been a few members that have uh, moratoriums on, on new projects. Their boards will no longer allow them to do new business with DSS. And there are a few other boards that are discussing terminating existing contracts because of the poor payment record. Um, I don't dispute what Commissioner Park said that, that certainly there are others that are trying to find a way forward, um, but it has been a true challenge. And some of the most respected and longstanding providers in our sector are sort of on the list of folks that are in or not in a position to do anything new with the agency. Um, can you speak a little bit about your membership and the history of, of HSU so that we kind of get a, a, a kind of a clear picture of the sector a little bit? Sure. So our members, our, our organization was was founded in 1996, and it actually um, was two separate groups at the time. There was the Tier 2 Coalition for the Families with Children's Providers, and then there was um, a coalition with an acronym that I cannot remember or pronounce, but it was for the single uh, adult providers. And really, we were set up when the leaders of these groups were fighting against the city at the time um, that the Giuliani administration was really trying to undermine the right to shelter, um, was trying to erode the city's responsibility. And we all felt really called and mission driven to say that homeless families and individuals deserved 
high quality homeless services um, on demand whenever and whenever it was what's necessary. So these groups really came together and felt that there was safety in numbers. Um, and when you're trying to fight city hall to really make the case and to share best practices. So, so these are the folks that were the, you know, around since the beginning of upholding the rights that were codified in the Callahan consent decree and later the, the Boston and McCain litigation for families. Um, and, and these are pioneers in social services programs. I mean, if you take a look at our member list, you'll see that um, these are thought leaders, these are creative people, these are folks that founded the safe haven model, these are folks that founded supportive housing, these are, I mean, they're, they're the best of the best in terms of, of what um, the homeless services providers have to offer. And, you know, we have a vetting process for our membership um, that we actually had to create um, in 2016 or 17 to amend our membership policies to ensure that anyone coming into HSU as a member had to fill out an application and submit copies of their 990s and supply references because we were noticing sort of these new groups popping up that, that maybe weren't in it for the right reasons. And so we had to take steps to protect the integrity of our community to ensure that we were really um, surrounding ourselves with, with good folks. And it's not to say that nobody ever has a problem and there's nothing we can learn. We learn every day and HSU exists to support providers to improve practices. That's another benefit of membership, frankly, of the peer learning opportunities, the training and the technical support. Um, but it really does speak to the community that we've endeavored to build of people that are really in this to solve the crisis of homelessness and ensure that the safety net that exists is robust and equipped to handle all of the myriad of needs that that folks might have as they come into the system. Yeah, yeah, no, I just, I, you know, as a chair for seven years and had the um, opportunity and pleasure to work with you since 2016 and your predecessor um, before you, it, it is, um, you know, it, I think that this, that the issues that you raise get directly to um, the topic of, of today's hearing, um, because um, if we don't, and, and I'm of the firm belief and opinion that New Yorkers are willing to dedicate their tax dollars to uh, quality services that, that, in other words, it, you know, I don't think that New Yorkers are um, upset about um, uh, funding uh, not-for-profit providers that are doing homeless services. That, I don't think that that's what New Yorkers have a problem with. I think New Yorkers have a problem when um, when those providers turn out to be um, corrupt or um, or have other significant problems, and that they don't see uh, uh, New Yorkers don't see real real results, or tangible results. And so, um, you know, I think the case continues to be, need to be made at the highest levels of this administration to the mayor, to the first deputy mayor. Um, and to the director of OMB. And so, you know, I think that even though I'll be out of here in, in eight months, I think it's important that we continue to make those, that case. And I thank you for, for, for being out there and, and, um, and making, making the case publicly. And I, again, I'll make sure that, that your testimony goes directly to uh, Commissioner uh, Garnett and Adam Ox as well. Thank you so much. And you've been such an excellent partner and friend to, to homeless New Yorkers and helping build our resiliency and really just appreciate your leadership over the years. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. We'll now turn to Tawaki Kamatsu for testimony. Hi, can you hear me? I'm starts now. Um, so yeah, so with regards to today's test, today's hearing, um, it's basically about oversight of shelter providers, oversight of HRA to some extent. But Mr. Levin, um, when exactly are you going to hold a public hearing about corruption by HRA, corruption by DSS? corruption by DHS. I've testified to you repeatedly. Um, I don't think you've ever once conducted such a hearing. Um, yesterday, I submitted papers to the Second Circuit Court of, of Appeals. I got a split, uh, split decision, partly in my favor. There's going to be a three-judge panel that's going to make a determination as to whether to impose severe restrictions on the uh, City Council's ability to conduct public hearings. Um, I was trying to actually have today's hearings um, postponed but um, that's going to be for a different day. Um, are you, also, Mr. Levin, are you aware of the fact that there was an arsonist in my building in the last uh, couple of weeks? He tried to light his mattress on fire, then the fire department had to come um, hose down the building. So in terms of like security guards, uh, security and shelters, where exactly were the security personnel when this person is trying to um, set the building on fire? 
Also, there was another woman, she was coming back to my building the other day. She was staggering in the street. Um, two cops nearby had to escort her into the building. Apparently, she was trying to sell some kids nearby drugs. So think about it. If there's no oversight of the shelter system, you have people who are, you know, trying to sell school kids drugs. So why in the heck, where's your oversight of HRA? Where's your oversight of DSS? Um, also, I got some discovery material in the federal lawsuit that I think I previously apprised you about on February 1st. That discovery material confirms that Mr. Banks was actually the catalyst for the illegal acts that were committed against me at public forums beginning in April of 2017. Um, there was a witness who I wanted to testify on my behalf in that case, Robert Vargas. I testified on his behalf to you, I think on February 4th. That expired. Can I continue? You can continue. Oh yeah, um, we were in the room in the chamber on February 4th, 2019. He was a disabled military veteran. I uh, told Mr. Banks by email in August of what, 2020 that he needed an air conditioner for his apartment. It was pretty humid back then. Instead, um, he had fire departments break down his front door and escort his body out of the building. So think about it. If it's pretty humid during the summertime, you don't have an air conditioner in your apartment. If I sent an email to Mr. Banks, I think on August 2nd or August 3rd of 2020, why is it that he couldn't get a portable AC for this disabled military veteran on whose behalf I repeatedly testified to you and also uh, talked to Mr. Banks and other people at public uh, town hall meetings, public resource meetings. You had one in um, October of 2017. I told you that I was being illegally prevented from attending it. You told me that there was nothing that you could do in spite of the fact that you were the moderator for that town hall. So again, if people are dying in the building in which I reside, I try to go to these public forums to testify on their behalf. Why is it that I can't walk through the doors and say, you know what, you're a legislator, you're a lawmaker, you have a legal duty to do something about it, especially in the aftermath of what Heim Deutsch experienced recently by being fired from the New York City Council. So last question is, Exactly when are you going to do your job? Can I get an answer? Mr. Komatsu, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about um, your, your, your friend. Um, did you say he, he passed away? Yep. This past August? His name was Robert Vargas. He was about 62 years old. He had multiple strokes. So he used to stagger along the street. I used to carry him up the street because he was severely disabled. He was a Army National Guard veteran, and also a military uh, Marine veteran. I testified on his behalf on February 4th, 2019 in the chambers, as well as I think uh, September 30th. And Mr. Banks was there on February 4th of 2019. So I could forward you the email that I sent to Mr. Banks in August of 2020, apprising him of Mr. Vargas's need for that air conditioner where nothing happened. Please do and I'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for it. Are you gonna read it? I've sent yeah, you sure. Yes, I will. I've, I will. I've sent emails to you before, and I have not gotten a response. And I'll, I'll search. I'll search my email uh, for, for uh, Robert Vargas as well. Okay. Fair enough. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Tawaki. We are going to move to our next panelist, Wes Rickson. Time starts now. All right. Uh. Good afternoon, committee chairs. Uh, my name is Wes Rickson, and I'm a community member of the New York City Anti-Violence Project, AVP. Uh, AVP empowers lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and HIV-affected communities and allies to end all forms of violence through organizing, education, uh, counseling, and advocacy. Um, today, I'm here advocating for a more resources for my sex working community as a means to provide a safer space and um, facilitate a betterment of life. I urge the city to invest in a resource center for sex workers that is uh, culturally competent and safe. Um, since even before the pandemic, the sex work community is operated under halting conditions. Uh, mutual aid campaigns within the sex work community have always been remarkable and how much assistance has been rallied. However, uh, the community should not have to entirely fund this alone. Um, sex workers need a brick and mortar resource center to act as a physical hub for redistribution, as well as a secure, confidential and a familiar place to fulfill any needs. We at AVP see a shelter, um, a learning center, a legal resource, 
child care and sexual health services. Um, with the DA's office's uh, recent decision to no longer prosecute prostitution and throw out thousands of bench warrants spanning back decades, it begs to reason that New York City is ready to head in the direction of decriminalization. Um, since the pandemic, in-person sex work has become not only safe, but difficult to maintain for those who must engage in it for survival. Uh, online fees have surged for sex workers um, since options to work in person have become unsafe and scarce. Uh, rental spaces are also unsafe and costly. Work online is oversaturated. Um, income is fluctuated for many workers, which has caused a lot of workers to file for unemployment, uh, relocate, or just work in unsafe conditions. Um, uh, we appreciate past support. No. You can keep going. You can keep going. I'll just, it's just one more sentence. Um, we at AVP uh, hope to ever so gently demand that the city fully fund this resource center so that sex workers can conduct their work safely and efficiently now and uh, post pandemic. Um, we do appreciate past support and we look forward to working with you again. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Wes, for your testimony. At this time, we have gone through the list of our registered panelists. If we have inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you in the order your hand is raised. Seeing none, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. I'm now going to turn it back to Chair Gibson for closing remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Aminta, and thank you, Chair Steve Levin. I wanna thank all my colleagues for joining us today for a very important hearing. I wanna thank the administration, the Department of Social Services, the Department of Investigation, all the members of the public who have testified. I wanna thank the Sergeant at Arms, uh, for leading today's hearing. Thank you to the team for assembling us and allowing today's hearing to go off smoothly. And with that, uh, Council Member, uh, Chair Levin, do you have any final remarks? Uh, no, Chair, just wanna thank you very much um, for, uh, for co-chairing this hearing and for your dedication to uh, transparency and accountability in government. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you so much, Chair Levin. We do have a lot of work to do, but I appreciate everyone's commitment dedication to making sure that we uh, operate efficiently and we assure all of our clients that are in the shelter system that we are there to support them, to give them a safe space and to make sure they are given quality services with the utmost integrity by all of our providers. I thank you all for joining us today. Today's joint hearing of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations and General Welfare is hereby adjourned. Have a blessed afternoon, everyone. And thank you to all the staff. Thank you so much.